I'm Michael Gooden, Regional Ag Land Care Facilitator for Riverina Local Land Services. And uh, we recently held a workshop with John Williams, who's an agroecologist based in uh, North America, in Canada. He presented a day talking about the benefits and the science behind multi-species cover cropping. Uh, I hope you enjoy this presentation. Uh, pleasure to be here and, and thank you Michael for, for the invitation to come and speak. So um, I am based in Canada at the moment. Uh, I've, I've much of my I'm originally from Brisbane, but I um, and worked here for a few years and then have actually lived abroad ever since. So I uh, spent a lot of time in the UK and working predominantly throughout Europe and, and a couple of years ago I moved to Canada. Uh, I still do lots and lots of work back in Europe. I'm, I'm back there uh, three or four or five times a year and, um, and, and do quite a bit of work in, in now throughout Canada as well. So that's probably where I'm, I'm most active and so I do bring a bit of a um, Northern Hemisphere perspective in a sense and so consequently some of the information that we're going to start with through the lecture side of things will be of a general nature. Uh, we'll, we're going to obviously be here to focus today on cover crops so uh, I'm, and, and I'm, I have a bit of a big passion around soil so really we're going to talk and link a lot of the um, discussion around cover crops back to soils and, and soil health. So that's going to be really the core of the focus. But um, the intent then will, with the panel discussion this afternoon is then we will, or afterwards, we will then, we'll, obviously we'll get a little more applied. Uh, we'll talk about some of the practical application, but also bring in some of the regional and local context here. You know, things are obviously very specific. Uh, and very different here to how it operates in Canada and Europe and so um, this is that will be the point of the panel there we'll, we'll try and take some of the broader learning and the principles perhaps so to speak and we'll and then apply that through through a local um, discussion so that's roughly how we'll, we'll kind of set out the day for today um, that's my website and Twitter if anyone's on Twitter feel free to to have a um, have a little look at that. So, okay, so the format the, for today, what we're going to, the topics that we'll cover, we're going to start with really just a, a pretty broad overview and introduction on cover crops. You know, what they are, why would we use them, some of the benefits, and then we'll kind of, we'll really do the how through the panel uh, this afternoon. So we'll kind of discuss, well, it's up to you to kind of steer the panel. I've got some kind of thoughts there, and we'll talk about some seeding rates and species selection, seeding dates, some of these kinds of things, timings bits and bobs there, but really let's make it discussion based, you know, so have a listen to the lectures and then really it would be great if you can steer the discussion, I'll facilitate and we'll steer the discussion uh, in the panel, um, but I've got a few th things in mind that I'd like to touch on, uh, but very, very keen to, to hear from you guys as well. Um, so that's really, that, that'll, that'll cover the how is, is around the panel discussion. And then we're going to do another lecture also just around the benefits of plant species diversity. So specifically looking at this transition away from monocultures and what happens to soil chemistry, soil physics, soil biology, what happens to insects, to disease, to weed pressures, what happens to soil organic matter when we begin to transition away from monocultures towards more plant species diverse um, production systems. Now, uh, and I'll throw in some examples there around even companion cropping, intercropping, uh, you know, even that little transition from one to two species. Uh, indeed, even that small step actually starts to have big impacts on some of the soil properties and disease pressures and, and these kinds of things. And I'll, I'll share some, some studies around that with you all. Uh, so that's going to be that second lecture. So basics around cover crops, specifics into diversity, and then we'll um, have a, a bit of an overall kind of panel discussion there. <coughs> Could I just get a quick show of hands, perhaps in terms of who's in the room here? Uh, is, is just just trying to tease out who's got livestock and things or not. So, so anyone who who's exclusively cropping, uh, could I just get a quick show of hands? With no livestock, just cropping. Okay, there's a small number. So, who of you would be mixed cropping and livestock? Okay, most. And so are any of you just livestock? Okay, also quite a few too. Okay, so that's that's a pretty good mix. You've probably got about. 50 mix, uh, half or so mixed, half or so um, um, livestock, and, and a, few, a handful of pure croppers, actually. That's quite interesting. Usually it's the other way around. Um, usually a dominance of just, of just croppers. So. OK, awesome. And anybody here organic? Is anybody organic in the room? No, everyone.
Sean's kind of, yeah. yeah, we've got one here. Yeah, okay, brave soldier in the front here. <laughs> um, okay, awesome, good. Well, yeah, that's a topic for another day, but um, some of how we, our traditional definitions, I think, of things like that, the classic old divide of organic and conventional seems to be breaking down these days. There's so much fascinating stuff happening in the middle ground, you know, whatever we want to call it, regenerative agriculture or what, but uh, there's a lot of really fruitful collaboration and interaction I see happening in the middle ground where uh, kind of both sides are moving into the middle. It's quite interesting what's happening in the world of kind of soil health these days, but anyway, that's a topic for another discussion. Okay, so um, as Michael said, we're happy to share the video, so, um, and I can also share a, a, a PDF of the slides, so if anybody wants the slides and things in a note format, um, I'm also happy to circulate that around with. So don't feel like you have to write down everything on the slides, but, uh, but you do have to write down everything I say. <laughs> okay. okay, all right, okay, let's dive in uh, to cover crops. So really I thought I'd start by saying a few quick slides around Photosynthesis. Let's just talk a little generally around photosynthesis. This is obviously how plants grow, and this is going to be understanding that is going to help us then steer and lead into the discussion around how we're going to use specifically cover crops and their photosynthetic potential to help kind of drive fundamental kind of changes in, in soil health, etc. So it starts with this very simple little equation, photosynthesis. And it's this idea, of course, that plants are breathing in that carbon dioxide and taking up water, and they are stitching that together to build carbohydrates, CH and O. They've got those three key ingredients that they need to then bind those together to form sugar, the very first, or glucose, the very first product of photosynthesis. You get from that building block, that little, that little sugar molecule, then they can build their plant biomass. They can grow, build their roots, build more complex carbon compounds from that building block. Growing shoots, growing roots, using that for energy, producing flowers, producing seed, fruits, etc., etc. So really, it all comes down. Everything stems back to the core of this simple little equation here of stitching together, taking in carbon dioxide and stitching that together into, into chemical energy in which the plant can use. Now, as much as the plants are growing and this photosynthetic process is driving what's happening, there's also another key ingredient that the plants need in order to drive this process and that is minerals. It is the nutrients, the essential macro and micro minerals. So, so yes, it's energy, air, water and nutrition. And it is those role of those macro and micro minerals, the essential plant nutrients, which also then help to catalyze that process of photosynthesis. We can't do it without minerals. They also help to drive plant growth, drive biomass production by catalyzing that little photosynthetic equation that we see here. So we also need the minerals. Now, if we take that nice kind of simple concept here, as you can see here um, in emoji speak here, and let's put a little more detail into it. I'm saying the exact same thing, but just a little touch more detail there. Okay, really, again, it's, it's the role of carbon dioxide and water and then those in the gold rare, the minerals. And it's those minerals that act as, as I say, catalysts, or they're part of these enzyme systems, it simply just means the catalyst, that they will then help to stitch together and build that sugar molecule, and of course produce oxygen as a byproduct for us. And then it's the plant again requiring nutrition to then take that building block and then build a whole lot more complex and diverse carbon compounds inside its body. So it starts to stitch together that little simple sugar, it starts to stitch it together to build more complex sugars, more complex carbohydrates. It'll start to link in some nitrogen and sulfur, forming little amino acids, linking those together, building some of our protein that we're also generally trying to chase in terms of improving quality. But a whole host of other plant-based compounds are also synthesized from that building block, fats, uh, the cuticle, oils, waxes, lipids, hormones, uh, vitamins, uh, pigments, you know, colors, uh, smells, aromatic compounds, these volatile organic compounds, all sorts of smells and scents. Uh, these are also, again, byproducts of, of photosynthesis. Other protective nutrients, defense com uh, compounds, uh, protective compounds, defense chemicals, and also root exudates. So the point is to say that all of these various diverse kind of plant compounds that, that the plant builds as part of its biomass, but all of these other various 
colors and tastes and flavors, scents, all these other things, all these other plant compounds, they're all products of photosynthesis. And again, none of these can be produced without the minerals, the essential plant nutrients that catalyze this process. So if we have a mineral deficiency in the soil, this process will be held back, will be limited. Yeah, so we've got to address nutrition. Now, that's actually, funnily enough, part of the reason why we use cover crops in the first place is to try and free up nutrition, access minerals from the soil, unlock them, make them available, bring them up into the biomass of the cover crop, and then return it so that uh, for the benefit of the following cash crop. Yeah, so funnily enough, what we're trying to achieve is enhance nutritional availability uh, through using through growing plants for the next uh, cash crop. Okay, so that's the, the core of the idea. Now, when plants grow uh, and produce this various biomass, there's three core um, elements, there's three core components that then get integrated back into the soil. The three core pieces that we need to manage, components that we need to manage. Uh, for uh, the cash crop benefit, and that's your shoots, roots, and exudates. And we're going to, I'm going to tease out more of this concept as we move through the rest of the lectures. So we've got shoot biomass, uh, above ground litter is one part of the fraction. We've got the roots, the actual root biomass, and then as those plants are growing, they are photosynthesizing, they are excreting also carbon compounds, they are excreting these root exudates, sugars and carbohydrates, uh, and all sorts of other compounds out into the soil. And so it is these three pieces of the puzzle that bring the benefit of cover crops, is root shoots and exudates. And they're all a little different, and we will talk a little more on each of those. So it's not that plants only breathe in carbon when they photosynthesize, they also release carbon. Uh, and they do that through these root exudates. Now, the, the traditional view of root, ex root exudates focused on things like organic acids. So um, various kind of, there's all sorts of different organic acids, hydrogen and, and acidic compounds that the plant will leak and excrete out of the root system. And the, the kind of classic soil chemistry dominated view of soils looked at that and said, okay, well, the plant is releasing these acids. It does this to acidify the soil, to solubilize, to scavenge nutrients from the soil. So we see this direct solubilization where those acidic compounds, those acids, will solubilize minerals, release them, and make those nutrients available for the plant to take up. And of course, when the plant takes up those minerals, well, then it will use those minerals as catalysts for photosynthesis to, to grow biomass, as we were just looking at. So again, nothing wrong with that. That's, that's exactly what happens. However, it's just that that's kind of half the story. Plants don't just scavenge minerals from the soil through these organic acids they also release a whole suite of other root exudates, sugars, carbohydrates, amino acids, food sources, raw food sources, to feed microorganisms. And it is those organisms, the biology of the soil, it is those organisms that also can play a role in solubilizing nutrients and releasing nutrients and delivering those essential minerals back to the plant. So the plant does directly solubilize from the soil, but it also feeds biology and lets them do the work. And, and this is an important nuance because, the, again, the, the classic kind of view was very focused in this one side. It just said, had this very chemistry kind of narrow kind of view. Now we see the pic bigger picture that there's this whole living world of soil biology there that also play a very important role in accessing and scavenging nutrients. Now, yes, the plant can scavenge nutrients from the soil itself through those organic acids. However, the microorganisms in the soil, they can do it much, much better, much, much more efficiently. They have many more tools in the toolbox. The plants have a certain set of tools, that's its various root exudates, that's the tools that it has in which it can scavenge nutrients. Because the soil microbiology particularly exists in such vast diversity, tens of thousands of different species of bacteria and fungi, so particularly some of these microorganisms, well, with such diversity of organisms brings such diversity of tools or strategies to sc scavenge and solubilize minerals. So the point is, microbes are much more efficient, much more effective. They have a broader array of strategies, modes of action to access and unlock the soil nutrients. So that's why the plant will invest in them. 
And that's really the strategy that we're also trying to employ through cover crops. It really becomes a question of how do we manage plants and how do we manage those cover crops to help them help the biology actually cycle and scavenge nutrients and, and, and overall improve that soil health. So it's, that's the way we kind of, so consequently when we're, we're going to talk here about cover crops, I'm going to talk a lot around about soil biology because it's, it's, we're using cover crops to prime biology to do the work for us. So they will, um, they will overlap. So then it turns out the amount of these root exudates that the plants release as they grow, as they photosynthesize, is really quite significant. There's a lot of carbon that the plants breathe in and then release as, as these various exudates. Now, it depends it's on a whole range of different factors and different plant species. Uh, it's, there's a lot of variables here. But here's some kind of ballpark guideline numbers for you, just to illustrate that certainly what we do know is that annual plants will release less than perennial plants. So annual plants, 20, 30 odd percent of the total carbon that they breathe in will be pumped out as these exudates, whereas perennials it can be 30 up to 50 odd percent uh, across that life cycle. Uh, the amount of carbon being released. Now, that's not a um, static figure each and every day. It's a dynamic process. Plants m release most of their root exudates in the earlier stages, in the vegetative stages. So in that first four to six to eight weeks, in that kind of um, window, that's your bulk period of, of root exudation in the vegetative stage. When the plant transitions into reproductive mode, and begins to focus on flowering, on grain fill, on sizing fruit, etc. That's where it will prioritize sending carbon, sugars, etc. up into that developing grain. So that's where the root exudates get turned off. Okay, the tap gets turned off there and root exudation slows down. So across that whole life cycle, these are the kinds of numbers. It, it, it's in the early stages, it can be as much as 80% of the carbon that they're breathing in will be released but then as it declines over time. So, so across that life cycle is, is what these numbers are, are kind of quoting. So anyway, either way, the point is to say that the numbers are quite significant, whichever way we look at them. I mean, why wouldn't the plant just keep some of that carbon? Why wouldn't it hold on to it and grow more root system, produce more tillers, you know, fill more grain, size more seed? Why wouldn't it keep that carbon for itself? Why on earth would it excrete it and just give it away? Of course, it might look like a bit of a waste at face value, but indeed it's a very valuable investment. It's the plant investing in those microorganisms, investing in the soil biology to drive that nutrient cycling because the plant knows that the biology can do it much more effectively with a broader set of tools than the plant can directly itself. So that's indeed why uh, the plant will invest so heavily in them. So these root exudates, these carbon kind of compounds, are an important aspect in the dynamic between plants and, and soils and plant, between plants and microbes. It is the root exudates that is the link between the world of plants and the world of the microbiology. It's the root exudates in which how they communicate, how the plant communicates to microbes. It re it's not just about sugars, it releases all sorts of other chemicals in there. These are called kind of communication chemicals, signaling molecules. The plant will also send various messages out into the soil microbiome, telling the biology to bring certain things back. I need some zinc, uh, bring me some zinc. I need some copper, or, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, so the, the root exudates, they are raw food for the biology, but they are also tools, these signaling molecules, chem chem uh, communication chemicals. So there is an important link between what plants do above ground and what microbes do below ground, and that link is, is through these exudates. Okay, so that's in a nutshell a super quick um, tour of photosynthesis and, and just basic plant growth. Okay, so it's about growing plant biomass, but it's also about growing root exudates. And the key thing is we need the minerals, the essential macro and micro minerals, to catalyze that photosynthetic process to make that whole kind of thing work. So let's then move on to talk about then managing specific um, stands of plants, uh, i.e. cover crops, in order to help improve soil health and drive some of those various kind of interactions. So what is a cover crop? Well, I guess the key part of the definition is, is it's generally a plant that isn't harvested. 
Now, you can harvest them, uh, and we'll come to this in, in various ways, but generally the definition would be it's a plant grown with the specific intention of protecting or improving some kind of element of your production system, of that agro-ecosystem. Now, many, we might say, well, it's, it's there to protect and feed, and uh, the soil is often one of our core focuses, and, and rightly so. Um, but actually, cover crops bring all sorts of other benefits as well in terms of the wider water, the hydrological cycles, and the water systems water infiltration, water recharge, these kinds of things. Uh, they can also have agronomic benefits. We can also do it with the intention of improving yield, improving quality, improving nutrient use efficiencies. There are some agronomic reasons why we might specifically grow a cover crop. And there are also some other reasons for the wider ecosystem, uh, for the ecology, growing cover crops to support wildlife, um, pollinators, uh, predators, these kinds of things. So we'll, we'll tease out some more of these examples as we, uh, as we go forward. But the core of the idea is, says, okay, it's not something that we're harvesting, it's not a cash crop per se, but it is something that we are growing in order to improve or protect some aspect or element of the, of the wider ecosystem. So what kind of plants can we use as a cover crop? Well, the list is endless, actually, and by no means is this an exhaustive, exhaustive list. This is just a few examples. Uh, there's all sorts of different plants that can be used and indeed there's all sorts of different plants that should be used. Part of the benefit of cover crops when we start talking about cocktail cover crops or diverse cover crops is that all of these very different plant species, well they all have different growth habits, they all have different root biomass productions, they're all different species, they release different types of root exudates. So what we're trying to do with a diverse cover crop is actually try to get a selection of all of these so that we are hedging our bets, so to speak. We're stimulating different and various aspects of the soil function through the selected and targeted use of different species. So, you know, for example, okay, legumes, they're going to help to bring nitrogen into the system, okay, an obvious benefit. So if that's the goal, let's design a, a legume-heavy um, cover crop mix. Uh, our, say, our monocots, say our grasses in particular, of course they produce a lot of root biomass, that fibrous root biomass, and that's really a great source of material to build soil organic matter, if that's the strategy. So we might lean a little towards some of those grasses. Some of the cereals, of course, good quick to establish, quick soil protection, if that might be also the goal. And then we have a range of different kind of broad leaps as well. I mean, a lot of the brassicas, of course, uh, they can bring the various kind of biofumigant type benefits that they can bring. Uh, but we have all sorts of other uh, examples here that also uh, have all sorts of other functions. Enhanced mycorrhizal fungi, say flax is a good one for that, for example. Um, you know, phacelia, okay, buckwheat is great for phosphorus scavenging. Phacelia, the bees love it. You know, so you've got all these various different particular functions of the plants. And that, therefore, the goal of the cover crop is, okay, you could do a monoculture cover crop. Uh, it, is a, it is a perfectly fine scenario if you're looking for a very specific function. There's nothing wrong with that. Let's say you do want to access phosphorus. Well, let's go for a, a, a cover crop of buckwheat. Okay, that's perfectly fine. It's just that there's some benefits in it. And, and by the end of the lecture parts this morning, when we talk more around plant species diversity, it's just that there are some benefits when we start to bring more diverse root systems together. There's a synergy there. There's a one plus one that equals three. Uh, they can start to interact with each other in different ways in which a monoculture root systems interact with each other. And there are some, some synergies, some benefits to be had in doing that. So you can have a simple mix. Could be one species, could be two or three or four. That's fine. Uh, some people like to go right out and go up to 10 and 15 and onwards and 20. Uh, I don't have any strict opinions about this. I think generally do what works for you and within the budget, what seed you can access affordably, etc., uh, and try and be as diverse as you can, I think is my kind of general interpretation of that. So, so anyway, this is just a bit of a selection. There's uh, many other plants that you could use, but perhaps these some emerge as some of the kind of the key um, a key uh, species that, that might be of, of choice. Now, this is a, um, also a neat little image here, um, looking at kind of breaking down some of the different cover crops into some of their functions. It's, it, I should stress, it's not about having diversity per se, diversity for the sake of diversity. You, you really want functional diversity is the key. 
Uh, so, you know, you, you wouldn't say, well, I've got 10 different varieties of oats, and that's diversity. Okay, they're all oats, but okay, a little bit of varietal diversity can be a good asset too. But you might say, well, I've got oats, and I've got triticale, and I've got some barley. Well, you know, they're all quite similar. They're all cereals. They're all, you've got some different species, but they're all having a similar growth habit, bringing similar benefits. You want some cereals, you want some broad leaves, you want legumes, you want functional diversity is the key. It's, it's not diversity for the, for the, per se, for the sake of it. So we can look here and then, as you can see from this slide here, we've got a selection of, uh, again, some grasses, broad leaves and uh, some legumes. And we can also divide that into cool season or a warm season kind of species. So this is a really, again, a nice useful chart to uh, help select. So, you know, obviously, are you going to be growing cover crops in the summertime? Are you going to be doing it in the wintertime? Then you're going to be leaning towards choosing from the warm species uh, for the summer covers, uh, and you might be leaning towards some of the cooler species for winter covers or other companions. So, so you know, it depends on your time of year and what you're trying to do. Um, but equally, you know, here in Australia, say, where we are a very we do most of our cash cropping during the winter time, so you know that leans us towards a lot of C3 type plant species. You know, we're a very wheat dominated kind of system. There are benefits to kind of breaking out of those temperate species and intentionally including uh, some more uh, tropical, some kind of more warm species plants because they're different. C4s are different from C3s, and so what you're trying to do is again increase the diversity. We have a lot of temperate dominated production system. So there's benefits of trying to bring some of these warm species. They have a different type of growth habit, different types of root exudates that they release uniquely. And so there's benefits to bringing some of those into a, a, a kind of a, a very temperate kind of dominated production system or vice versa if we were um, the other way around. So, okay, that's just, a, again, you'll, you'll have this on your slides, but that's just a nice selection of opportunities there uh, of species to, to choose from. And again, you want some grasses, you want some cereals, we want some other legumes, and some of these other broad leaves. And we, again, perhaps want a mixture of warm or cool species. Again, the more and more diversity that you can design into the picture, the better. It's just, it's a really important tool that, that kind of hedges your bets. So, okay, well, which species? Well, where do I start? You know, which ones? And it really depends on, well, what's the goal? You know, what are you trying to achieve? That's going to help narrow down the list of species as to who you might choose, which ones you might choose. So are we trying to get some free nitrogen? You know, are we trying to increase the nitrogen fertility of the soil? Are we, are we aiming for phosphorus scavenging, phosphorus release? Are we trying to free up some of our phosphorus reserves? Are we trying to capture nutrients? Are we trying to suck them up? Is there, did we over-apply fertility? Would there be some fertility still uh, in the soil? Uh, can we suck that up uh, in a, uh, an, a uh, post cash crop, uh, cub crop, uh, post harvest uh, cub crop to kind of capture some of the nutrients that may not have been used by our cash crop? Uh, so similarly, nutrient cycling, are we trying, I guess that's a, bit, a little bit like phosphor P release, are we trying to release or unlock or access some nutrients? Are we trying to dis uh, suppress disease, are we looking for pest and disease kind of benefits there to that um, cover crop? Are we trying to encourage, uh, support the ecosystem, so encouraging pollinators, uh, predators, these kinds of things? Maybe looking for goals around weed suppression. Are we trying to smother weeds? We might choose some very aggressive, competitive species. Consequently, is our strategy to is our goal to increase soil organic matter? Then that might steer who, which species we choose. Or are we also looking for maybe some other soil functional benefits, compaction alleviation, for example? So we might want to choose some deeper rooted uh, species, particularly there to help get down and, and, and deal with maybe some subsoil or a subsurface compaction. Okay, so, you know, what is it you're trying to achieve? That is, think about that question to start with. That's what's going to help you think and design or select the species that may be best for, uh, for that particular cover crop. Okay, so then that, that's why then, well, often we're, we're looking for multi-functions, aren't we? We're not necessarily looking for just one of those things. Your goal might be many of those things on that list, okay? So that's why then by default we start to lean a little towards this idea of these diverse cover crops using these mixtures versus a monoculture. And yeah, I mean, a picture says a thousand words, you know, and you can see very clearly why. Uh, here we have different species, different 
plant growth habits, some more upright, some more prostrate, some deeper rooted, some a little more shallow rooted. We've actually got a, a lot of um, synergy going on here within this diverse mixture. Uh, and actually, that can be actually a lot less competitive. You know, often we might look at that and think, well, look at all those different competition, look at all those different species, aren't they competing with each other? Surely this nice monoculture here over on the left, surely this is, this is efficient, the most efficient opportunity here, everything's the same, we can manage that, we can get the timings right. Uh, you know, this has been kind of the mentality of, of production agriculture, this, this kind of dominance around the idea of we want everything uniform, everything to be the same. Um, and undoubtedly there are some benefits in that. Of course there are some very practical um, benefits that make managing that crop easier. But I also kind of look at that and I see a lot of competition there too. You know, there's a lot of competition in that monoculture. Yeah, tr traditionally we'd look at that as a crop as a well, of course spray out any of the weeds, they're going to compete for moisture, compete for nutrients, get rid of everything else, let's just keep everything the same. But when we do that, I mean look at those root systems, Let, let's start here. You know, those various root systems of this monoculture. Because it's a monoculture, it's all the same species, it's all the same variety usually too, I'm really, really narrowing down that. When I look at all of those root systems, well they're all exploring the same volume of soil. I actually see, I, I see some competition there, they're all competing for the same volume of soil because they're all the same. I mean here we have some deep rooters, here we have some shallower rooters, well those roots are scavenging up there and these roots are scavenging down there. Actually I see less competition in that sense. Well what about the, the timing of that plant there over on the left? I mean it's all flowering all at the same time as well. It wasn't flowering a few weeks ago, won't be flowering in a few weeks, but right now it's flowering. Well that means every plant is needing the same nutrients required for flowering all at the same time as well. One small example, let's say boron. You know, boron's really important for pollen, pollination, etc. So now you've got all those plants flowering at the same time. So they're all scavenging boron at the same time, same nutrient at the same time, all from the same volume of soil. So I kind of, I kind of look at that and I do see a lot of com competition over there on the left. There are definitely some synergies to be had when we go more diverse, different crop stages, different species, different growth habits, different space for competition, different root structures. Different species also means different root exudates. Each different plant species is releasing a different fingerprint, a different cocktail of those chemicals that are in those root exudates. And that's what's really important about these diverse mixtures, is that with more plant species diversity, we have a wider range of tools, a wider range of root exudates, in which we can communicate to the soil biology, in which we can actively engage with, recruit, turn on, uh, you know, access, send various commands to them and get the biology to do what the plants need. Okay, so you're simply increasing your array of tools when you transition from monoculture to more diverse mixtures, because now we have a whole new set of tools, a whole new set of, a more diverse set of exudates that can do more to the soil biology than just one set of root exudates, one set of communication tools, okay? So there's just obvious reasons why we might transition. Now, you might, again, it might depend on your goal. If your goal was nitrogen fixation, we could make the argument that would say, well, if your goal was, I need more nitrogen in the system, well, sure, maybe you'd be better off doing a monoculture of a legume. Sure, you might get more nitrogen into the system through that way. But as, like I said before, I think on a practical level, well, we usually are looking for many of those benefits, many of those functions. We're not often looking for just one of them. So I think, just, you know, again, not, not opposed to a monoculture cover crop, they have their place, but uh, hedging your bets, not knowing if what this is, the season going to be a bit moist, is it going to be a bit drier, is it going to be a bit hotter, is it going to be cooler? Which of, the, which of the single species do I go for? Is it going to love those conditions that are coming? Well, I don't know what's coming. So I hedge my bets, go more diverse, and we encourage that at least something will, will grow through that season. So again, it's a risk management side of things. I think there's, there's not a right or wrong answer to that, but just how you approach it. So <clears throat> of course, plants can be competitive as well, and they can be collaborative. And again, that's that point. You know, we would look at that monoculture and we would think, oh, any other plant is just going to be a problem. Let's get rid of it. 
Um, the reality is it can go either way. Okay? Plants can be competitive or they can be collaborative. And it really just depends on what the plant species are. Some work well together, some don't. So we have to design for that synergy. We have to des design for the collaboration uh, over the, the competition. Of course, things can compete. It's not to say that always more diverse will always be better. It, it needs to be carefully kind of thought out and designed. But here's an example here illustrating this is uh, from the US. This, was, um, uh, in a, this is from 2006. This was in a drought year that they had. And this was a cover crop trial of looking at some single species. And we're looking at biomass production here. And you can see each of the various kind of single species there versus the kind of the cocktail mixtures. And you can see that as soon as we add more diversity into the mix, we got a much more greater biomass production. Now, what we're looking at here is, is of that kind of cocktail diverse mix, here's a full rate, full seeding rate of that cocktail mix. And here's a half a seeding rate. So indeed, you can see as we cut the seeding rate down, as we use less uh, of, the, uh, of the various cocktail seeds, you can see, I don't have a pointer, but um, you can see at the top there, we got a little bit more biomass production, we got a little bit increased biomass production by using a lower seed rate. Okay, so that is highlighting right there, that little difference, that inch or so at the top there, uh, I can't point to it, but that little inch or so at the top, um, that's your competition. When we lowered the density, when we lowered the seeding rate, so we eased off the competition, we got an increase in biomass. So indeed, there was too much competition there. As we lowered that seeding rate, we did indeed get a little increase in biomass. That's the effect of competition. However, that little increase that we got, you can see there, or that little decrease we got from into the more um, heavier seeding rate, is a fraction of the gain that we got, the collaboration that we got from, let's say, on average, somewhere around about here-ish, to get up to there. You know, that was your, that was your collaboration effect. That was your competition effect. So, so again, it, it, again, it can go either way. Uh, but again, it, if it's designed for accordingly, there are synergies to be had. Yeah. Your cocktail mix is it just made up of those species that are listed? It, it, it's, it, it is a mixture of those and some others. Yeah, it wasn't exactly those same ones, but it was a, it was a general mix that they used that included some of those, but also some others. Yeah. Okay, so it is both. Competition is a factor, yes, uh, but so is, comp so is collaboration. Okay, that it can work either way. And I think traditionally we've had a very competition, you know, blinkered view of things. In being so focused on that competition, we've missed uh, being a little blinkered there. We've missed the opportunities for collaboration. And now we're looking at plant species mixtures with fresh eyes. And, oh, actually, there are indeed opportunities for um, for improvements. Okay, and here's another example. Here we're looking at um, uh, monocultures on the left-hand side, and then we're transitioning to some some mixtures, some polycultures over on the right-hand side. So over there uh, on the left there. Uh, you can see this is a, a this is a tillage radish. This is a, a daikon radish type thing that is in a monoculture, and then we've added a few extra grasses and legumes here like on the right hand side. And you can see that there's a distinct color change. I mean, it looks greener on this side. It looks a little more paler on, on the side where there's the monoculture. But what about down here? We have some oats down the bottom here of a monoculture. As soon as we add a, a few more legumes into the mixture there, well, you can see again. Well, well, not only is the color changed from being paler to a little greener, but look at the growth stage of the oats. You know, the, the oats are more advanced. We've also changed that dynamic there. You know, again, shouldn't these be looking worse on the right-hand side? There's more competition. You know, shouldn't these be looking a little worse? Shouldn't these be looking a little better? It's, you know, nice, perfect, even stand. Well, again, just a little example highlighting that uh, with more diversity, there can be a, a synergy uh, at, at play there. Okay, so why to then use some cover crops? Why might we do it? What are some of the benefits uh, in which we, we might see? And as I touched on there earlier, it, we might think about this in a soil context, in a water context, uh, agronomy and, and ecology. So from a soil point of view, things like soil protection emerges as a big and obvious one. You know, we're protecting that soil from, be that the sun, you know, trying to conserve uh, some moisture, but particularly from erosion, you know, we're going to see, as we already see now, you know, heavier rainfall events, uh, wind, windier conditions, windstorms, these kinds of things, 
so wind erosion, soil erosion. You know, the first the first mantra has to be do no harm. You know, keep your resource where it is. So the the soil protection is a big and major um, first benefit of of cover crops. Uh, soil function, we might be intentionally with the goal of trying to increase the soil function or the soil quality in some way. So what is the function of the soil? The function of the soil is to provide nutrients, to provide moisture to the crop, provide a, a growing medium. Well, cover crops can help make nutrients available, help access water, etc., uh, in which we can therefore improve that soil function. Uh, soil health would be another one. Again, a bit of a hot topic these days. However, we might define soil health, but you know things like the, the chemical properties, the physical properties, some of the biological properties, all of those things can improve. And well, that's what we're going to explore in the lecture two. Uh, and maybe soil organic matter. Definitely, uh, cover crops can help us build soil organic matter. And we'll, we'll talk more to that now too. So water, things like water infiltration and drainage. Now that's, that overlaps a little bit with agronomy there. You might want to improve your water infiltration from a cropping point of view. But we also want to do it from a landscape point of view, from an, uh, from an ecology point of view, uh, helping to hydrate the landscape, prevent, you know, obviously water runoff uh, uh, and, and, um, and erosion, etc. Uh, equally, we want to keep nutrients in the soil rather than leaching through or keep the soil, keep the sediments there in the field as well, rather than sedimenting um, and, and uh, increasing turbidity of our, of our water streams, etc. So, you know, there's various water-related reasons, water use efficiencies for the crop would be another one, uh, various kind of water-related reasons or benefits to, to using uh, some cover crops. Okay, from a cropping or an agronomy point of view, or uh, let's, let's think about it in that context, okay, we might want to increase soil fertility, and that's good for pasture production, that's good for our cropping production. Uh, of course, we need nutrients, we need fertility uh, to grow that plant biomass. Uh, that can also, cover crops can help us improve nutrient use efficiencies. So when we start to access and unlock minerals from the soil, make them available, well, that means we're going to need less fertilizer, need less inputs. I guess that's going to be a useful strategy to improve your nutrient use efficiencies. Uh, okay, if we are going to graze cover crops, we'll talk about this briefly at the end of the session, uh, there's some obvious benefits there from a forage point of view for the livestock, uh, and we can also uh, grow cover crops to help suppress pests and disease, uh, particularly you know, smother out weeds, uh, but also those more diverse mixtures are, and I'll share a very interesting study on this in, in the second lecture, these more diverse mixtures are um, less attractive to insects, less attractive to disease. You know, when we have a monoculture there, if a disease comes through, if that monoculture is susceptible, well, of course, it's just too easy for that to be spread for that disease to spread through that monoculture. Uh, as soon as we have a more diverse mixture, well, it's not so rapid uh, for that pest or that disease to spread through. It's just an obvious, um, there are certain benefits to monocultures undoubtedly, but there's some serious um, Achilles heels to it as well, uh, that being one of them. It is the design fault of the monoculture that makes it more prone to disease, makes it more prone to pests. That's simply a consequence of that genetic uniformity. If that plant is susceptible, then they're all susceptible, and that means you see rapid uh, spread throughout. So you know, there's there's economic benefits in terms of our dependency on herb helping us to kind of another integrated tool, helping us reduce our dependency on, say, herbicides and and, and other pesticides. Uh, then benefits for the wider ecology, for the wider landscape. Uh, are we creating habitats for beneficials, pollinators, etc., uh, helping them to give them habitat to, to have then also help fulfill an agronomic function that can be part of an integrated pest management strategy, um, but also just generally improving the, uh, the natural capital of the land or helping the ecology provide uh, some of those ecosystem services. Okay, so let's have a look then at some of these kinds of things, um, some of the benefits of cover crops. We're going to do this primarily just through some kind of a lot of imagery here, just to give some nice kind of clear and visual examples of, of what we're talking about. Okay, and again, soil protection, a really big and obvious important one. As soon as that soil is covered, it is protected from the elements, be that rain, be that the sun, you know, be that wind, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and there's a you know very nice clear example there. Of, just some simply some ryegrass under sown under some maize. You know, it's just such a simple, easy strategy. 
uh, and yet, you know, okay, this is a particular problem in many parts of the Northern Hemisphere where you're going to be harvesting the maize in the autumn. And of course that means autumn is coping, winter is coming, that's your wet season, you know, and this is a huge problem. Wider row spacings, we, we combine off, we take off that corn, and we're just left with bare soil, and we're left with bare soil in the autumn time where, yeah, in the Northern Hemisphere, some of those heavier rainfall events are um, more likely. So, uh, you know, under so some, some ryegrass or any other companion, bang, I problem solved. I mean, just total soil protection in that, it's so easy and yet so obvious. Um, interestingly enough, in the Netherlands, as they've just passed a, a, a new law there, it's actually been in effect now just for the first year now. Uh, it's, you cannot grow maize without undersowing. Every farmer who grows maize has to undersow. And of course, most farmers will use ryegrass because it's a ch the cheapest seed they can buy. But um, you know that kind of legislation there is, I have to give you an example of a good one. Uh, there's just some obvious benefits there. So OK, protecting the soil. Now, when we protect the soil, when we grow plants in soil, as those roots grow down into the soil, uh, those roots help to pull soil particles together. They help to aggregate the soil, so they're helping to improve the soil physical kind of condition. So, and we want good aggregated soil because that's what's going to help with infiltration. That's what's going to prevent water from running across the landscape, but actually getting that water down into the soil. It's directly linked to how well our soils are aggregated, how well they are stuck together forming structure, uh, forming pore space in which then water uh, can also move through. Okay, so the, the thing is to say that one of the easiest ways to aggregate soil, take soil particles and kind of bind them together, stick them together, when we, when we aggregate soil and stick the particles together, what we're creating is the important thing in between the aggregate. It's the pore space. It's the pore space in between those aggregates that's so critical to help then that water and moisture move down through the soil. Now, yes, that's important from a, a landscape point of view, preventing erosion, but it's also important from a cropping point of view because that's what is going to recharge your subsoil moisture. That's what's going to help the agronomy of what you're trying to achieve is by getting more water into the soil and getting it down where it can be stored rather than most of that uh, running off. So, you know, as soon as we grow roots, we start to pull soil particles together, we help to aggregate the soil, we start to clump soil together, forming better structure. Okay, and there's a really nice example of some rhizosheaths, some, some quite juicy looking rhizosheaths there, um, where you know, soil is now clumping together and it's the, that biological action of roots, root exudates and microorganisms and interacting and sticking soil particles together. Okay, a really nice example of clumping on some rhizosheaths there, but what they're also doing is this, aggregation kind of process that you can kind of see there in, in those images. So we're helping with structure, aggregation, and when we do that, we'll, then that helps to improve the water quality that then leaves the farm, uh, the water quality of the wider ecosystem. You know, so when water runs, it should be running clear. We shouldn't actually be seeing uh, sediment um, uh, laden water. It should actually be running clear when we have proper infiltration functioning for us. And uh, there's a nice example of that. And this is, you know, from a nice image from Tasmania. This is exactly what we should not be seeing. You know, it's when we have those rainfall events, and our our soil is literally being washed off, uh, washed out into the ocean. This most precious resource that, of course, we need directly for production, um, just literally going down the drain. So one of the easiest ways to prevent this is just keep the soil covered, and that's that soil protection benefit that we saw at the beginning as well. Uh, so one of them, well, okay, it's a biological interaction that helps with this aggregation. It's the role of roots, exudates, and biology, and that's then one of the big benefits of cover crops is we feed soil biology. All of those various microorganisms, the various micro critters, and all the way up to some of our larger insects and earthworms, uh, very simply, they need to be fed. The life in the soil, like all living organisms, needs to be fed, and one of the easiest ways in which we can feed those organisms is to keep a living plant, living roots over the soil, because then they've got food to grow. And they can feed on that root biomass, they can feed on those root exudates. And so it's one of the easiest ways to increase soil biological activity <coughs> uh, is simply keep the soil covered with living plants, and diverse cover crops have a role there. Uh, here's here's a, a study that was just literally recently published uh, this year already. 
a big review on do soil, do cover crops benefit the soil microbiome, a big meta-analysis. So we're kind of reviewing lots and lots of studies, taking a kind of global picture. So we conduct a meta-analysis, compiling results of 60 relevant studies, reporting cover crop effects on the soil microbial properties to estimate the global effects uh, and explore the, the current landscape of this topic. Overall, cover cropping significantly increased parameters of soil microbial abundance, activity, and diversity by 27, 22, and 2.5% 2 respectively compared to those of bare fallow. Okay, so across those, um, all of those diverse climatic regions, taking a global view of the benefits of cover crops across all of that variation, soil types, et cetera, et cetera, across all of that, we see these consistent benefits to the soil biological activity uh, as evidenced by this uh, very recent review study here. So, okay, they, they help, indeed, they, they do help greatly with um, soil biological properties, and that's just kind of one study. I'm going to share some other examples of that in, in the next lecture. Uh, so we might also use cover crops to access mineral reserves. We want to unlock nutrients from the soil. There are lots of nutrients in soils. It's not just about what's soluble and what's available. When we do a talk to soil test and look at kind of the extractable nutrients, what we're looking at is a picture of the more available forms. Say maybe what's soluble, uh, perhaps what's exchangeable, more medium term supply. Well, there is another pool of nutrients that exists in your soils. That's the total pool. It's there, but it's locked up. It's not actually soluble. It's not available, but it is there. But it's locked up. It's bound uh, to other minerals. Um, and it's there as a potential bank account. It's there as a resource. You just need to unlock it. And the key to unlocking that is some of these biological interactions. That's what's going to help take that large pool of nutrients and, and break them down, unlock them, make them available. And again, it's that point that microorganisms have many, many more tools in the toolbox to do that than plants do. Microbes are specialists at accessing this big total pool of nutrients. And this pool of nutrients can be tenfold or more greater than, than what you're used to looking at on your soil test. When you look at a soil test and say, oh, I'm low in zinc, I'm, I'm low in phos, whatever it might be, you're looking at the more available forms of those nutrients. Uh, you do indeed have much more of those nutrients present in your soil. They're there, but they're locked up, and they're not coming through in the extractant that the labs are using. So the point of cover crops is that you encourage roots and root exudates and biology to work on those soluble nutrients, uh, sorry, work on those total nutrients and make them soluble and, and make them more available. Okay, so that's, that's your kind of overall um, overall strategy. And so, you know, there's also, just using one example of, of, say, phosphorus here, there are many ways in which we could do that. We can use biofertilizers using the microorganisms directly themselves to kind of access and unlock uh, FOS <coughs> in this example. Um, we could use other management practices, uh, so, you know, supporting organic matter growth, for example, or uh, using other uh, various amendments that overall help with pea cycling. Or we can use plants, you know, plants specifically they release these various root exudates that can access phosphorus, uh, these various kind of enzymes and things. So we can use plants to do this. These are our tools in which we can um, use to, to access and unlock um, unlock those reserves of nutrients that, that are there in the soil. And what about general nutrient cycling? I mean, unlocking soil reserves and nutrient cycling are a little bit interlinked, but we could also think of it this way is that you know, when we're growing that cover crop, what we're trying to do is suck up any other leftover nutrients in the soil, get them up into the biomass of that plant, so that then later on when that plant dies and decays, it will release those nutrients, and we will time that release with another cash crop, so that the cash crop can benefit. So we see this kind of catch and release kind of concept, where we're going to catch all of the nutrients first with the cover crop, and then we're going to release them later on for the cash crop and we're just aligning the timings of those rather than straight after harvest uh, where we might have a lot of excess nutrients, well, then they can be lost if they're left in the soil. So let's suck them up into the plants and store them in the plants before being released later on. Yeah. Just on that, if your, your next cash crop is timed like fairly soon after your cover crop, is it common to see that tie up of minerals in the organic portion? So it's a deficit to your cash crop that you need to overcome. Mm -hmm. So um, just, I'll repeat the question for the camera there, but 
um, question was uh, if your if your timing of that into the um, into the, after the cash crop straight into another one is quite close, can we see a tie up of nutrients if we're using uh, a cover crops, which might then have a negative benefit for the, the next cash crop? And and yes, you're right. So cover crops and that catch and release needs to be managed within uh, the appropriate time scale. So. So yes, in the short term, what you're seeing is a nutrient loss, a nutrient tie down when those covers are taking it up, um, but then they will release it later on. Now, the question is what and wonder which conditions in which will they release that and is it timed for the following cash crop? And so certainly we know that if your plant is a little, if your cover crop is younger, a little more tender, a little more juicy, of course it has a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio, that means it will break down quicker. If the, if the cover crop is more mature, has more lignin, more cellulose, then a wider carbon to nitrogen ratio, then the release is going to be a lot slower. So, so it does depend on your termination uh, of the cover crop as to at what point it is in its cropping cycle, and its growth cycle, uh, as to how quickly the, the nutrients will be released. So the, the, the basic message is, is that a younger, more tender plant is going to release quicker, an older, more mature plant is going to release slower. So you might want to adjust your term, termination times uh, accordingly. Um, okay, so um, we're going to be cycling kind of nutrients, and part of that is also preventing those nutrient losses. And this was just, uh, just a quick chart from uh, some work done in the UK, where we can see that just immediately as soon as we have plant cover, you know, living cover, we're looking at nitrate leaching here. And as soon as we have actual living plants, living cover, you can see we have a dramatic decline in overall nitrate leaching or nitrate loss. So the more cover that we get, the more plant living cover, of course, the more nutrients they're sucking up uh, versus, say, for example, a, 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 a stubble kind of thing you can see over here with bare cover. Um, as soon as we have living plants, the amount of nitrates that are lost from the system declines for the very obvious reason that living plants will suck it up and take it up. So again, it's that point that the more cover that we have, the better we will see that nutrient um, scavenging and to, to then prevent um, some of those losses. Um, then some of the things around ecosystem benefits, uh, of course it's about habitat, it's about mixed species having some flowers and you know various kind of plant heights, so flowers are good for pollinators of course. Um, taller plants, just anything that generally has taller biomass is also good, ha creates more habitat for predators and, and beneficials. So um, anything there, we can see there's all sorts of benefits to the wider ecology, as well as what's going below ground. You know, all of those root and root interactions <coughs> helping to improve the, the soil, uh, soil function there also um, for, is the obvious kind of benefits. There's, a, again, a nice little example there of uh, a nice little strip through a field providing some habitat uh, for um, beneficials to then um, do bring an integrated pest management, bring an agro agronomic benefit into the into the cash crop. Yeah, so some obvious kind of uh, um, benefits there. Uh, improving soil organic matter might be another reason that we would try to grow a cover crop, and that's for the various obvious reason that, as we all know, soil organic matter is very important. Uh, it's very important for the chemistry, for the physics, for the biology of the soil. Uh, the overall kind of soil health, it's the, the magic bullseye perhaps in the middle. And, and all I'll say is, is, just quickly on this one, is that we have this um, growing body of evidence that highlights that it is roots that are the more important factor in building soil organic matter than shoots. Okay, it is root biomass, it's roots that make soil, it's roots that build soil organic matter. Shoots, they're more important for protecting the soil. Shoots go on the surface, they provide that stubble retention of course, all very important for moisture conservation, for protecting the soil, worm food, uh, habitat for insects, all very important functions of your shoots and your stubbles, absolutely. But if the goal is to build soil organic matter, it is roots that are much more important than shoots in doing that. So if your goal is to build soil organic matter, you must start thinking below ground. Think about how can I grow more roots? That's going to be your ticket to building soil organic matter. Shoots, above ground biomass, it makes a small contribution, a very slow and a very small contribution to building soil organic matter. Roots make a much more efficient contribution. They're, mu they're much more better pathway to do it. Okay, so I'm not saying don't, don't not use stubbles, but th their function is different. 
they protect the soil, they bring all of those other benefits. It's roots that build organic matter. So you might want to start thinking then about varieties that have better rooting systems, uh, cash, uh, cover crop species that are deeper rooters, that are bigger rooters. Okay? If the goal is building humus design, when you're choosing your cover crop mixes, choose plants with bigger root systems because it's roots uh, and not shoots that, that build uh, organic matter. Don't be lured to looking about looking at cover. Don't assess your cover crops from how they look above ground. You know, you have to be taking your spade in. The real benefit of cover crop is the roots. It's what's happening below the ground. This, what's happening above the shoots is part of it and linked, but the real direct benefit is those roots. So make sure you think below ground. Here's a perfect example. Okay, again, this is just an example from Scotland here, but. Again, this is an autumn sown cover crop, winter's closing in, it's a narrow growing window. They don't have a very big growing window, so many would say, well, cover crops are a waste of time. You know, the, the sea, winter closes in too quick, everything shuts down. I only had such a short window, look at this piddly little biomass, this was hardly worth it. You know, it's a few inches tall, this cover crop, well, what a waste of time and space, why would you bother? Well, again, don't be lured into looking and focusing on the above ground. Okay, yes, it might only be a few inches tall. Yes, it looks a little sparse. But what's happening below ground is what's important. And yet we still have very, this is same field, same day, all three photos, same field, same day. Um, and yet we have excellent root biomass going on down below. There is lots of benefit happening here to this cover crop, even if it is only a, a few inches tall. Okay, so don't, um, don't, be, um, don't, don't focus too much on above ground. Take that thinking below ground. Okay, so it's roots uh, and not shoots, so think there if the strategy is to build soil organic matter, but ultimately it is linked to how well you are managing plant growth, how well you are managing photosynthesis, driving that cycle up the top, you know, the more photosynthetic potential, the more biomass you can grow, particularly root biomass, particularly with these root exudates that we've mentioned, it's the roots and the exudates that then feed into the microorganisms in the soil as they digest and break down the roots and the exudates they grow their bodies and their dead bodies as we now know uh, dead microbial bodies make a significant contribution to building soil organic matter uh, so this is called microbial necromass dead microbial bodies they make up as much as half of what we consider soil organic matter is made up of dead microbial bodies and so the question the focus becomes on well how do we most efficiently grow microbial bi bodies how do we eat most easily grow microbial biomass and, and the answer to that is that it's roots and root exudates are better food sources to grow microbial biomass than the shoots are. So again, it's this focus on the below ground component. <coughs> it's the roots and the exudates that then drive this microbial growth and their death and their decay, which is what then makes a significant contribution to building soil organic matter. So if your goal with your cover crop is build organic matter, start thinking about roots and below ground. Okay, and then just uh, lastly, a little bit on covers, on grazing covers, sorry. Um, well, you know, I think, as I've just emphasized, if the key benefit of the cover crop is the roots and the exudates, I kind of, I don't mind what you do with the shoots. Now, if you want to keep them on the surface for soil protection, that's absolutely fine, and moisture conservation, absolutely fine, and you should in a very dry environment like Australia. But equally, if you want to graze those shoots, I think that's also a very good use of them as well. Shoots are designed to go through an animal, be that livestock like this or through an earthworm. Earthworms will come up, they will feed on the shoots, they will take the stubbles and residues and drag that down. Shoots are designed to go through an, an animal digestion, cow, sheep, earthworm, whichever. Uh, roots are designed to go through the microbial digestion. Roots are for the soil, shoots are for else. So if you want to put that through an animal, that's absolutely fine by me. I think that's a good use of the shoot material because you're putting a, an economic gain into that. So you may as well turn that uh, shoot biomass into some economic, economic advantage. Does that speed up your nutrient cycling as well, using an animal? Sure does, yeah. So the question was, does uh, animals speed up the nutrient cycling? And absolutely. You know, when they take, so that's you know, linked to your question too earlier, Matt. When an animal takes that cover crop, which we might be worried about, well, how long is that going to take to decay? Is that going to start to tie up nutrients from my cash crop? Well, take that uh, shoot material, put that through an a animal digestion, uh, through that rumen, through that fermentation. Well, of course, 
that speeds up the digestion massively so that then when the manure comes out, those nutrients are far, far more available. So indeed you are very much so uh, speeding up that process of, of nutrient cycling. Uh, okay, so that's that really cattle, they're providing that manure and that manure of course feeds back into growing more biomass and that biomass feeds back into producing more forage for those animals. So it, you have to admit, uh, I know I'm sure some of you, there's a lot of discussion about the whole livestock um, reintegration part of the soil health kind of principles and many farmers just really are not interested and don't want to go down the pathway of livestock and that's fine. I, I think you can do it without them. You don't have to have animals. There are lots of really good soil health, the other parts of the puzzles, pieces of the soil health kind of principles that all help and all work. I think it's all good. Um, but I think it's rather obvious there are some very clear benefits to bringing livestock uh, back from a, again, a landscape, an ecosystem point of view, from a microbiome diversity, from a speeding up the nutrient cycling. There's lots of obvious benefits to bringing them back if you can do so, but I know that's not for everybody. Joel, if you then let it go as a reproductive stage and then go to the harvesting, does that negate a lot of all that that's happened before? No, indeed. So, so from a root exudate point of view, as I touched on before, as those plants become more and more mature, they're turning the root exudates off, that, that, they're turning the tap off there. And, and it is those, um, it is, I haven't, we're not gonna, I haven't got time to elaborate on this, but it, it is particularly those exudates that play a more important role in feeding this cycle and growing microbial bodies and producing dead biomass to build humus that are even more important than the roots themselves. Um, so, so from that point of view, yes, you're turning off the tap a little um, when the plants become more mature and you're not getting that benefit. So that certainly if you, were to, if you had livestock graze at that point in time, that's a perfect opportunity to reset the clock, take that biomass, put it through an animal digestion, make good use of it that way, but also bring the plant back to a vegetative stage where it will keep those exudates turned on. And you then, this is why animals and grazing animals, uh, of course, help to build soil organic matter much quicker than without them. Uh, this is one of the key reasons. Now, it's not to say that if you didn't do that or if you let those plants get more mature, that somehow that's less beneficial. I think there's still benefits to them, the root decay, there's still benefits to the, the, to the shoot decay. Yes, I think you're, what, really what you're doing though with the livestock is just kind of speeding up the process. And it is a better way to do it. You're, you're, you're keeping that plant back turning those rutexidates on. And it's those that we're now beginning to understand are particularly important in, in driving a lot of these cycles. So, so I wouldn't say it's essential, I wouldn't say it's a waste if your plants got too mature, but I think there's, th there'll still be benefits to the biomass decay, uh, but certainly there's, there's the gains to be had by. Are sheep and cattle equally affected? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, yes, uh, a lot of people say from farm, if you ask a farmer that question, there seems to be a lot of farmers that say that they really do feel that the cattle are more effective than sheep. Uh, many, you know, I hear, you know, many of this, I hear this often out of North, out of North America and these kinds of things. I, I, don't, I haven't seen any clear kind of distinct evidence that says one or the other or either way. I, I think they're, they're both can be still beneficial. Anecdotally, many might say that cattle maybe have the nudge, you know, of course the big benefit of what cattle can do over sheep is that cattle are happy digesting, you know, more complex stuff. You know, so when we're talking the more mature, not this example is a good picture is a good example, but when we've got more higher lignin, higher carbon to nitrogen ratio material, cattle are going to eat that more happily than a sheep is. So, so I think from that point of view, you're going to you're opening up the door to better nutrient cycling of crop residues with cattle than you are with sheep. You'd have to give them that at least. Yeah. Okay, well, that's my last slide anyway, so that's good timing. Um, let that finish and then we can have a quick discussion. So really, in summary, all I really want to say here, and I'll, I'll return to this image, is to say that as much as we like to think about this idea of soil health and concepts around soil, and we'll ex we're gonna expand on this now in part two, uh, around this idea of chemistry, physics, and biology. Our soil is a balance of chemistry, physics, and biology. We've gotta bring and integrate all of that kind of thinking bring biology into the picture. Absolutely, rightly so. It's a good model, a good way to think, a good framework to think about soils. But I'd argue that perhaps a better way is a four-part framework that brings plants into that picture. You know, it is the role of plants, plant growth, root growth, root exudation, that as plants grow in soils, indeed, the presence of those plants will change the chemistry, change the physics, change the biology. And that's what we're going to explore now in this next lecture. I'll talk about the effects of plants 
on these aspects of, um, of various soil function and soil quality. So I'd argue that how you manage plant, how you are managing your plant communities above ground is also having a direct relationship with how you are managing your soil below ground. And that's where cover crops can be so beneficial, is that we are having a very intentional focus, intentional management focus on growing plant biomass, diverse biomass usually, for the benefit of building soil health. Um, so it's, it's just a little bit the opposite way. You know, often we might say, well, I need to make my soil healthy in order to make my plants healthy, to make my crops healthy. And there's nothing wrong with that line of thinking. It's just that it also goes the other way. If you make your plants healthy, your plant communities above ground, well, indeed, they will also help to make your soil healthy. So it does feedback, uh, indeed, both ways. OK, there was a, a question. We're, we're, that's what we're going to explore now in, in part two. This is really fascinating theoretically, and, and it, it's so inviting. Um, a lot of the information I've seen about it and the stuff you presented today does come from the Northern Hemisphere. And, you know, their country's have a crop twice a year in some places. Mm -hmm. They've got heaps of moisture, and moisture's our biggest constraint. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just thinking in my mind, what can we do, you know, you know, if we cover crops with the summer fallow, but then we've utilised the moisture that we're trying to store mm -hmm. for what I'm saying. Can you take us through, and maybe you're going to do this, uh, through some systems that we could actually apply this in Australia? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so that, I think you came in a little late, but... Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, that's okay. So what that's part of where the panel discussion this afternoon is, is really we're going to do exactly that. I, I'm intentionally trying to lay down some of the principles and the, the ideas here so that we will then take a very specific and local um, regional view through the panel and interpret some of this information through some case studies of what some local farmers here are doing. So, so, so yes, um, we will do that. Uh, but yes, of course, your point is absolutely valid. Uh, you have to, it's all good and well learning from elsewhere, but we have to um, apply, we have to translate that information into the conditions here. And of course, the obvious one is, is of course, soil moisture. Um, I, I would argue that I would say that you're already doing that. You know, you've already managed cropping in that context. Uh, you know, well, you know, just so in the UK we can grow 10 to 13 tons per hectare of wheat. Now, just because you can't do that here, does that mean you shouldn't bother growing wheat? Just because you can't do what they can do? Well, no. You interpret it differently under your moisture constraints, and you manage accordingly, and you do what you do. I, I, the same principle applies with cover crops. Yes, it's all good and well to what they can do. We're not going to do the same thing, but we're going to apply that in a different way. I think it doesn't detract from the underlying principles of it. It's just that, yes, of course, that all important practical application is the key. So, so we'll, hopefully we'll get some of your answers through the panel discussion uh, this afternoon. All right, so this next session we're going to really drill down specifically on this topic of, of more plant species diversity, this stepping away from the monocultures. Um, and we're going to explore so a little bit on various things. So chemistry, physics, biology, how more diverse systems impact those, uh, and then also some things around insects, weeds, and disease, and then briefly carbon at the end. Um, this lecture is going to be a, a little more technical. I'm, I'm going to be sharing just a lot of kind of scientific papers with you. I kind of flashed one up there earlier. You're going to see a lot of this kind of style. Um, I'm just, I guess it's a bit of an intentional thing to, I'll, I'll intersperse it with some nice images and things as well, but it's an intentional thing just to show you that there is this, um, there is a real growing body of evidence highlighting the benefits of more diversity. Uh, you, you're going to hear a good selection of that. So just to highlight that there's a, there's a lot of academic research out there. I'm going to share a little taster of that. Um, so some of it will be in, of a little technical nature, but I'll summarize it down kind of nicely for everybody. Uh, but again, just to highlight to you that there is a really good foundation. There is a good body of work around some of these ideas. And it's, it's I guess I say this to highlight, there's a, some fairly decent, robust evidence there. It's just, and again, to the question at the front here, it's, how, how do we then best apply this? How do we translate this uh, in, in the field kind of conditions becomes then the next focus. But let's lay down the foundation uh, to start with and then, then we'll kind of see how we go in our panel discussion. So this is kind of wh what we're going to explore. I'm going to help transition your thinking from the idea of that soils are just this chemical, physical, biological interaction 
to highlighting that indeed plants should sit within that framework. Plants are an expression of that soil health, yes, but your soil health is also an expression of your plant health. And your plant health uh, is a tool that you can design for, a tool that you can manage, and, and we'll, 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 I'll explain what I mean by that. And again, it all comes down to this, uh, central to this discussion is the role of root exudates. There's a, there's a lot of work going on in the world of uh, root exudates, a lot of research and um, studies at the moment looking specifically at these exudates. Uh, they're a very difficult thing to study. Uh, they're just um, extracting them even once they're excreted. They're rapidly digested by the microbes. There's a lot of challenges, technical, um, practical challenges to studying root exudates. But from the studies that we've done so far, we're already realizing that they are much more important than perhaps we once gave them credit for. That is for sure. They do play a central role in driving a lot of these interactions, also driving soil organic matter uh, synthesis. Um, and we're just really beginning to tap into how important they are. But, but I just put that up to the highlight. We are going to come back and talk a lot about these exudates, that they are central in this discussion. And really, this is the core the argument we're going to lay out. What happens when we transition from a monocultural kind of system to these more diverse systems? What happens with all of these various root interactions, the various root biomass there, uh, and particularly some of those various different root exudates? How does that impact? the various um, soil functions and soil properties which we might be interested in from, a, from an agronomic view, a point of view. And so I, I, I share this one, I'm going to go through this quickly, but I share this one, Just this isn't looking at a diversity study, this is simply studying the difference between wheat root exudates and fava bean root exudates. And it's just, I share it as an example to highlight that we can study these things and look at how, diff look at the different species and what different types of exudates they produce. And this is exactly what this study was doing, looking at studying these enzyme activities. So enzymes are some of those exudates and how that impacts the soil microbial activity. So what they found is the activity of these various enzymes here. Um, they found that these were much more active uh, in the fiber bean than the wheat. So simply to say that the legume released much more of these enzymes than the wheat did. And then they measured the microbial activity around those roots, the corresponding microbial activity around each of those root systems. And they found that the metabolic diversity, again, was much greater in the fava bean than wheat. Okay, so, so I'm just highlighting this to highlight that they are indeed very different. They trigger different microbial activities and different functionalities around their rhizospheres, around their right, root systems. Okay, so it's just, I and mean, what we often see is that, again, as true to this example, legumes particularly emerge as an interesting candidate here. It's legumes that have very strong exudates, very unique exudates. They're very good at um, si accessing cycling nutrients, solubilizing nutrients from the soil because of that higher root exudate activity. Um, and correspondingly, there can be good microbial benefits or biological benefits that come from that. Okay, so I put that up there just to set the scene to say that, okay, we can study these root exudates from different species. We can see that there are differences. And that's just kind of setting the scene to, to where we're going to go. So how can we increase plant species diversity? What are some of the practical strategies that we can employ? Well, it could be as simple as you know, more novel cash crops or wider rotations. You know, that's, that's diversity through time. You know, that's a good starting point. If you've got a very narrow rotation, uh, three crop, four crop rotation, hey, can we get that a little bit wider? That's a good first start. But even better if we could bring that diversity in at the same time. Uh, at the same space and time where we then begin to see those synergies of the one plus one kind of equaling three there. Uh, so, okay, it might be annuals and perennials. Uh, I talked about the difference in root exudation there. Annuals release less exudates, perennials release more. So as soon as we transition to perennial-based plants, they allocate more carbon down below ground. So there's an immediate benefit to perennial-based systems or bringing perennials into the system. Uh, because they allocate more carbon down to the roots, down as root exudates. And that's uh, for those obvious benefits that we touched on already. Um, we talked about cool season, warm season. So can we broaden the diversity of air? If you're a cool season dominant, can you bring warm or vice versa? Okay, we're here today to talk about cover crops. Definitely they're an opportunity for a burst of maximum kind of diversity uh, all at the one space of time. So more or more diverse pastures, of course, would be a, another similar example. Um, even things like companion crops and intercropping, they're emerging as a really interesting strategy 
where we can bring diversity a little bit more practically into the cropping phase. You know, I know it's, I know it's, it's all very well and easy to, to put this nice image up and say, well, yeah, there's all these benefits to greater diversity. Of course, that's easy with a cover crop. That's easy with a pasture. How do we do that in a cropping situation? Of course, it becomes much more of a challenge. Um, but as I'll share a few examples with you, even that step from one to two, you know, into an intercropping or a companion type scenario, uh, two to three, you know, there are quite significant changes that happen to, to the soil um, functionality uh, in that situation. So I'll share a couple of examples from that. Uh, biodiversity strips, we saw a few of those examples, the, the use of field margins, leaving tall grass areas, maybe flowers, pollinators, these kinds of things for, for some of our beneficials. Uh, and then maybe the role of trees. There's a lot of interest in agroforestry and silver pastures, you know, animals, grass and trees as an integrated system. Uh, as I see, there's a lot of interest particularly in, the, in, in these kind of systems at the moment, um, which is good to see. Trees can bring lots of benefits to the, to the system, of course, uh, in terms of the overall productivity as well. Um, so, you know, these are just some examples. Any of these we could begin to apply, they would all help to increase the plant species richness of, of our production kind of systems, uh, anything or some of, of this list. Okay, so let's have a look now, start with a little bit on biology. What happens to biology? I shared that big review study already with you and um, uh, of cover crops and uh, effects on biology. And here's another one which was also a big, a very recent study, a big meta-analysis, so again, reviewing lots and lots of other studies here. And here we conduct a global meta-analysis with paired observations of plant mixtures and monoculture. So we're comparing the monoculture and mixtures. From 106 studies, we show that the microbial biomass, the bacterial biomass, the fungal biomass, the fungal to bacterial ratio, and overall the microbial breathing, the microbial respiration, they all increase. The effects of the increased plant mixtures on all of those microbial attributes were consistent across the ecosystem types, including natural forests, planted forests, gra planted grasslands, croplands, and even planted containers. Our study underlines the strong relationship between plant diversity and soil microorganisms across those global terrestrial ecosystems and suggests the importance of plant diversity in maintaining below ground ecosystem function. Okay, so that's again a big review, many, many studies, many observations that they're looking at within those studies, that it is a consistent effect as we increase plant species diversity, we overall stimulate and increase the microbial functionality uh, of, of, the, of the soil. This was another specific study looking at uh, the effects of a part in a grassland situation, going from one to two to four to uh, eight to 16 species. And after seven years uh, in these experimental diversity plots, they found that the microbial community biomass, the microbial respiration, again, the fungal abundance, all significantly increased with plant species diversity. And they also showed that the nitrogen cycling or nitrogen mineralization also increased. So, so again, a specific example highlighting the, the links with the nutritional cycling, the nutrient cycling uh, happening there as well. Here's another one. Uh, looking at root biomass and exudates. Again, it's the roots and those exudates that play a, a central role in this. Uh, plant diversity significantly increased the shoot biomass, the root biomass, the amount of root exudates, the bacterial biomass, the fungal biomass. In particular, it was that fungal biomass that increased the most, shifting this fungal to bacterial ratio. So again, another example, highlighting the benefits to the soil microbial activity as we increase plant species diversity. And one last example, looking at mycorrhizal fungi specifically. Uh, you'd all be familiar with mycorrhizal fungi, I'm sure. How do they respond to more species richness? Here we're looking at the effects of one, two, eight, and 16 species. Uh, the mycorrhizal fungi in those 16 species plots, they produced 30 to 150% more spores and 40 to 70% greater spore volume in the 16 species plots versus the, the monocultures. Okay, and so more spores, greater spore volume. The spore volume is an indicator of the, the health or the viability of those spores. Okay, so mycorrhizal fungi also respond uh, very, very positively to um, plant species richness. Okay, so that's just a little selection of examples for you to show that there's a, a good body of evidence, plenty of benefits to the biology when we increase species diversity. Let's have a look at some nutrients and some nutrient cycling aspects. 
Uh, here, this is quite a neat picture, again, just, just illustrating that dynamic that different plant species release different root exudates. And here we're just looking at one variable here, the pH, looking at how different species change the pH in that rhizosphere around that root zone. And so you can see that here we're looking at bean. This is a faba bean again. And you can see that the exudates of that faba bean are making the root zone quite acidic. They're driving the pH down. Uh, this middle ground here is this is soybean. And you can see it's a bit of a weird kind of mixture there. Uh, and, and over here we have maize. And you can see that the exudates from the maize are more to the neutral. They're kind of cr making the plant rhizosphere around that maize more neutral. Now what's going on in the rhizosphere pH is often very unrelated to the bulk soil pH. We love to focus on the bulk soil pH in, in agricultural production and of course it's important and it has, it has an impact. But actually plants change their microenvironment to suit their agenda. They have the ability to regulate their own rhizosphere pH as you can see here. And so the point is to say that what would happen if we brought that bean and that maize together under an intercropping situation, put those two different root systems together and planted them in a mixture? Well, now those two root systems, of course, are growing, intertwining, intertangling. Well, this is very acidic. Certain minerals become highly available under those acidic conditions, some of the trace minerals, for example. So now the maize growing into that root zone can get some of those trace minerals that are highly available. But equally, things like calcium, magnesium, molybdenum, another trace mineral, is more available under neutralish pHs. So now the bean, as its roots grow into the rhizosphere of the corn, well, it can also scavenge some of those other important minerals that it requires for its growth. Molybdenum being one example there. Molybdenum is really important for nodulation and nitrogen fixation. So again, it's that point just to say that when the two root systems come together, and here we're just looking at pH. You know, we could look at 101 other types of exudates and functionalities, but this is just kind of one little example that when we bring the two together, there's a, uh, indeed, there is a, a synergy there to be had. And so here's a study looking at, uh, again, an example of a phosphorus limitation, so it will be a common problem here, where we're looking at species interactions of, again, just this step from one to two. Here we're looking at wheat and, okay, soybean in this example, but many other legumes would, would bring a, a very kind of similar benefit. So we're looking at below ground interactions in this legume cereal intercrop and we're looking at the interactions under P phosphorus adequate and P phosphorus limiting conditions. So they intentionally designed the study to say well, let's give the, the crops ample phosphorus and let's impose a phosphorus limitation on them and see what effects that species diversity just one to two has under phosphorus adequate or uh, phosphorus limiting conditions. So they grew the soybean and the wheat uh, as a monocrop and an intercrop under this P deficient and P sufficient condition. And they found that the root dry weight, the root length, the root surface area, they all significantly increased in P uh, deficient uh, intercrop situations. So even when there was a P deficiency imposed, as soon as we transitioned from one to two under low P situations, we saw a dynamic between the roots of the, both crops where we saw overall greater root length uh, weight and the root surface area. So the plants triggered greater root production, root biomass production, even under phosphorus limitations, and it was the synergy of the two that helped them do that. Of course, phosphorus is a really important mineral for root development. Phosphorus is a key driver of root development, it's a key mineral for that. And what we're highlighting here is that even under phosphorus limiting conditions, it's the benefit of that legume, those more acidic exudates, that synergy between the two that frees up, makes phosphorus available, so that they both benefit. Even the cereal then begins to benefit from that, even under phosphorus limiting conditions. Okay, so there can be, this is this point about using plant species diversity to access and unlock the minerals that are there in the soil and make them available. Uh, well, well, what about the obvious example of bringing a legume into the mix as well? Well, even under an intercropping situation, say, of two plants, we can increase the nitrogen fertility of the soil through the use of legumes. And indeed, legumes don't just share that nitrogen when they die and decompose for the next crop. Legumes can indeed share nitrogen in real time to the current crop, to the current companion, to the current cereal, for example, or canola, uh, through other pathways. Now, in order to get that benefit, it has to be designed for. There's a lot, I don't have time to go into all the details. There's a lot of nuance in this discussion. 
you have to choose the right varieties. Some are better suited to this than others. Certain varieties have different kind of more lateral root systems. That's very important. The, the two companions need to have better lateral kind of interweaving root systems. That will also help facilitate uh, the nitrogen transfer. If they're both deep-rooted species, species, you don't see as good nitrogen sharing. So it has, if the goal is nitrogen sharing, it has to be designed for, is all I would kind of intentionally say. But it's not just the decay of the plant tissues that as the legume breaks down and decays that it feeds that crop. It's also this direct transfer. One of those is through those rutexidates. Legumes release rutexidates, as we talked about. Some of those are amino acids. That's organic forms of nitrogen. So when the legume excretes these amino acids as rutexidates, if we have a grass or a cereal or a canola or another companion here growing near to that root system, it will scavenge, it will absorb those amino acids directly from the rhizosphere of the, of the legume. So that's another pathway, it's through these rutexidates in which uh, the other cereal, for example, will, the non-legume will scavenge. But if also, the third pathway, if the both plants are mycorrhizal, we also see direct transfer of, again, uh, amino acids, organic forms of nitrogen from the legume through the mycorrhiza into the crop. Okay, so indeed, plant species diversity, even just one to two, we can also see enhanced nitrogen dynamics at play uh, when we um, bring a, a legume into the system. And, you know, there are many ways in which we could do that. There's a lot of discussion around should that be kind of alternate rows. As we can see in the top here, we're looking at peas and um, beans, etc., uh, or more of a hodgepodge and mix. And, and if the goal is nitrogen sharing, well, it's clear that actually if they're all in the one row, closer root intermingling, that there's better nitrogen transfer. If the goal was disease suppression, for example, well, the evidence suggests that actually alternate rows are better for disease protection, disease lowering disease um, pressure. Of course, as the disease spores blow through this field at the top here, you know, then 50% of the time the disease spores are hitting a non-host. You know, so actually breaking up the rows is better to slow the disease spread. Um, but if we're looking for nitrogen sharing, then all in one row seems to be perhaps the better. So it really depends on the goal or your outcome. Now, that said, it, it also really depends on what your row spacings are. And if even under inter-row situations like above, if the roots are close enough and intermingling, indeed you will, you will still get some nitrogen uh, transfer. Okay, so that's just, there's a few examples there around phosphorus and nitrogen. Uh, increasing the fertility through more species diversity. Okay, let's have a look at f uh, soil physics. And here again, another example of intercropping here, just moving from one to two. Uh, so studies verify that intercropping increases the presence synthesis of these aggregates, uh, but the mechanisms are still poorly understood. Here we show that the macro aggregates in intercropping systems increased from 15 up to 58% across three sites in two years. That's just from one to two species. We are increasing the presence of those aggregates, those important aggregates that improve the structure and the porosity that let water infiltrate that we talked about this morning. We're increasing the presence of those aggregates anywhere from 15 up to 58%, just from shifting from a monoculture to a, 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 a beginnings of a polyculture, you know, a biculture then. So, how do we, uh, what is the effect here? Well, they, they determine that intercropping alters the soil microbial communities, and it is those who then further facilitate this aggregation process. Okay, and that's what I, we, we saw that image before. It's, it's the roots, the exudates, and the microbes that then glue the soil particles together that form those aggregates. It's a biological process. And when we simply shift from one to two plant species, we are driving more of those biological interactions that will also impact soil physics impact the presence and the synthesis of those aggregates okay so then again as we discussed it's all about that precious pore space in between we want pore space so that not just water will infiltrate but also for gaseous exchange we want oxygen to come into the soil many of the microbes in the soil are aerobic they need to breathe like we need to breathe they breathe in that oxygen and they release carbon dioxide and so when they release that carbon dioxide, we want that carbon dioxide to come out of the soil. We want oxygen to come in, we want carbon dioxide to come out. And when that carbon dioxide comes out, of course, plant, where's the stomata on a plant? It's on the underside of the leaf, as not by chance. 
Okay, the plants are then sucking up that carbon dioxide, that microbial respiration. They suck that up through that stomata on the underside of their leaves. So when we have compact soil, tight and compact soil, it's not just about, oh, we've capped off the surface, we're stopping moisture coming in. We're also stopping oxygen coming in. We're also stopping carbon dioxide coming out. And that carbon dioxide coming out is an important nutrient for the plant. Plants want that carbon dioxide. So part of the growth suppression we see in compact soil is the fact that we're not letting carbon dioxide out of the soil to help feed the plant, to help that plant photosynthesize, as we uh, talked about at the beginning. Okay, so let's then, that's a little snapshot there, chemistry, physics, and biology. Uh, let's have a little look at some of the discussions around some of these agronomic considerations, effects on disease, insects, and weeds as we shift to more uh, diverse systems. So again, here's another example of uh, intercropping, just shifting from one to two. Okay, here we conduct a meta-analysis to quantify the disease suppressive effects of intercropping cereals with legumes at different rates of nitrogen fertilizer. Intercropping reduced disease incidence by 45% on average. So this is in a wheat and bean. So we saw yellow rust and mildew lower in the wheat and chocolate spot and fusarium wilt lower in the fava bean. Okay, so a 45% reduction in disease pressure simply from going from one to two. Now the results therefore show that intercropping has a substantial and consistent effect on disease incidence in these cereal fiber mixtures across those various studies. Again, it's a meta-analysis. It's reviewing all sorts of studies, all different contexts, environmental conditions. But the effect is not sufficient to provide complete disease control. Therefore, intercropping is best used as a component, as an integrated disease management strategy. Okay, so sure, it didn't give 100% control, but I still think a 45% lowering in disease suppression, uh, that's disease susceptibility, is a fantastic win we should be using integrated strategies anyway. So if that's giving me 45%, well, okay, then I can use other strategies integrated into that. Can I manage nut nutrition better? Calcium, silicon boron, for example, they're really important in increasing the cell wall strength of the plants. Manganese and silicon are also really important for driving plant immunity. So we can use nutrition to heighten plant immunity to get a little more percentage of disease control. We could use biology, using biologicals, inoculants, some of these other beneficial microbes to also antagonize or suppress disease. You know, so again, all of these things begin to come together as an integrated approach. And I think a 45% reduction, sure, may not be complete control, but I think it's an excellent first step and a very easy one. We're just, I'm just asking you to go from one to two. I mean, it's not a big, big ask. Okay, still. Um, what about insects? This is a really interesting one. I talked about plants releasing carbon, they don't just breathe carbon in, they also release it through exudates, they also release it through the air, they also release volatile organic compounds, smells and scents, that's also carbon that is released through, from these little glands and through these trichomes, you can see these various um, uh, scents and, and smells that are released in the gaseous form, these are volatile organic compounds, carbon compounds. Now, some of those volatile organic compounds can actually make the plant invisible to invading insect pests. It can also at attract in beneficials. And what we can kind of see is that some pests here are actually getting uh, actually attracted in and then caught and stuck. So this is part of the plant's um, defense mechanism. There's also a, a class of these compounds that get released that are called semi-volatile organic compounds. So a volatile organic compound is just a gas. It's something that wafts off into the air. That's why it smells. So we have this class called semi-volatile organic compounds. And these are compounds that are small enough, they're light enough that they get released, they get off-gassed, but they're a little bigger. So they're not so small, they're a little bigger, so they don't just drift off into the wind. They get off-gassed, and then they fall back down again. So they fall back down to the earth, to the surface. And it turns out that these compounds, these semi-volatile compounds, can also have an influence over how well companions work together or not. So, so as you would know, some certain species are good companions, they're a good team together. And often we talk about it's the effects of alleliopathy and these alleliochemicals that they release from their roots that are very antagonistic to another. Well, it turns out that there's also these gaseous compounds that can also be antagonistic or complementary, that can enhance. So this is part of the reason why certain plants go well together 
is that they actually will off gas, particularly in the in the dusk time. They will, uh, and so if we go walking, we often you know get a lot of smells and scents from the from if we go walk in nature. The plants will off gas these things, and they will fall onto each other. And so those chemicals that get land on the plant can either be suppressive or supportive. Okay, so it's a whole other dimension to intercropping that we're only just beginning to kind of tap into. And so many of these chemicals uh, can also have effects on insects, uh, making the plant, as I said, invisible or attracting in beneficials, uh, these kinds of things. It turns out some of them can also, some of these chemicals can also stimulate immune response in the plant. So helping the plants turn on their immune system, so to fight off insect pests or even to fight off diseases as well. Okay, so it's very interesting. I don't know if you've, some of you might have seen some of those pictures and things online where they will often take two different plants that are growing, just one plant in one pot, and simply by putting them together next to each other. They're not sharing soil. They're not share, there's no competition for roots at play, but simply putting them next to each other, you can see one enhanced and one suppressed. Whereas put, put them away from each other, they grow, both grow fine. Bring them next to each other, one is suppressed and one grows. And that's due to some of these volatile compounds that can then be suppressive. Uh, but as I say, they can also be enhancing. They can prime the immune system, make the plant more immune to stimulate plant growth or make the plant more immune to, to pests and disease. <coughs> but again, just a little example there of perhaps next generation where some of this is also going as we understand more and more of the benefits of these plant diverse <coughs> systems. OK, so what about weeds? Uh, well, it's the obvious benefit here that under a monoculture system, if we just, let's, let's in our mind's eye, just remove all of those beans there, we can just see some nice rows of wheat. Well, I, then I can see all this bare soil exposed. So as soon as we see bare soil exposed, well, of course, weeds are going to fill that gap. So we're going to need some selective herbicides to manage those weeds. Well, what if I go and put a companion into the interrow? Let's fill up that interrow area with, okay, a bean in this example. Well, now those beans or any other companion, now they're going to be filling that niche, filling that space and suppressing some of the weed activity there. Now, then you could take those <coughs> two crops all the way through to harvest if you wanted as an intercrop, or if we treated them as a companion crop and we had a temporary companion there, um, there are many ways in which we could then take out that bean. Now, okay, a bit of cultivation would be one way. Some of you might not be too keen on soil disturbance, so that might not be relevant for everybody, but for some systems, obviously, say, an organic system, that's something that, that might be relevant. And what we've done is at least at least we've suppressed the weeds through that species diversity during that stage, and then we kind of mulch them down and um, <coughs> provide a protective mulching layer. Okay, so if you didn't want to inter-row cultivate, what about inter-row mowing? Okay, so now we're, you know, there's lots of really cool innovative ideas happening here, I see. Could we, could we intercede a companion into the cash crop? And then could we go through with some kind of, some kind of an interim mower to then suppress that um, campaign? So at least it's there, it's stopping the weeds, it's growing. As it starts to get a little too tall and maybe begin to cut, start competing on the cash crop, mow it back, slash it back. Of course, it'll leave all that nice residue to decay and feed the main cash crop. It also will trigger a lot of root exudation and root decay, which will also help to feed the main cash crop. So some neat ideas. You know, this is kind of novel stuff that people are playing around with, not what, not mainstream adoption yet, but the early in innovators are playing around with these kinds of fairly good ideas. Now we're not tilling the soil, no soil disturbance, just keeping that companion mode back and controlled uh, that way. Uh, and OK, then, of course, you can also still use herbicides to also take, use selective herbicides to take out your companions as well. So here we have an example of canola and beans. Uh, it's a bit not the best photo, sorry, a little shaded, but uh, you can see the canola plants down here. So this is from the UK where uh, we're going to be sowing in the autumn time. So they will drill these together in the autumn. They'll both establish in the autumn. Then they'll go totally dormant all winter long. And then come spring, they'll break that, emerge, that dormancy and off they grow together. So this is what you can see here. We're in springtime here, uh, late spring, where the, now the plants have emerged out of that dormancy. Of course, the beans, they emerge a bit quicker than the canola. They don't mind the cooler temperature still, and off they rocket. And as, right as you can see, right as these beans are probably getting definitely a little competitive, they're really beginning to tower over uh, the canola here. Um, right at that point in time, we could come through with a selective herbicide um, and take out those beans. 
Okay, then they decay, then those roots decay, then they are helping to feed the main cash crop. So, okay, we're still using a herbicide in this situation, of course. However, um, if we just think back to this point in time, if we think back to this image here, you know, at this point in time, we're, we're helping to lower that dependency on pre-emergence. We're helping to lower that effect of the herbicides maybe touching, having more contact with the soil, potentially having some negative effects there. So we're smothering out the weeds earlier on. Okay, we're still using herbicide, selective herbicide a bit later on, but at least it's just on top of the canopy there. It's less, perhaps potentially less negative effects down into the soil. Um, uh, and, and definitely some benefits during that autumn, during that winter, of more species diversity before we remove the companion. At least we've got the benefits of that root-to-root -root interaction all autumn long, all winter long, before we take out the companion and then the, the primary cash crop carries on through. Okay, so um, here's a few studies looking at, well, can more species diversity affect weeds? Yep, sure. It's possibly a, it sound like a dumb question. Uh -huh. but Never such thing. If you plant a companion crop to take out weeds and then eliminating that companion crop by having a specially trained Labrador, <laughs> <laughs> um, what's What's the problem with the weeds? The weeds provide a similar role, mm -hmm. yeah. and you know the expense and cost and the amount of fossil fuels being used to plant it, chemical to remove it. What is the role of weeds as in, in plant diversity, and yeah. what's the benefit of taking them out to plant a companion crop? Mm, yeah, no, it's a good question. I'm not opposed to the benefits of weeds. Uh, I think they bring lots and lots of benefits, and I, I agree with you. The, the really the key point there is simply just it's it's something that's a bit more manageable so with that you're you're filling the gap with just one other plant that you know you can control at a, at a later point in time leaving the weeds you're going to get a more diverse selection of weeds whilst they're there that's going to be a beneficial thing i would totally agree with you for sure but then you may be limited with the practical tools in which you can use to then take them out um, so your herbicide may take some of them out, but not others. Okay, so it's really purely a practical management point of view, but I think your question speaks to, to a good point that I agree with you. I, I'm not all about anti-weeds. I think they do bring lots and lots of benefits. Really what we're trying to do is just replace the weed with maybe another plant that has a specific function as well. So if we wanted the nitrogen, which if, if our strategy was to try and lower nitrogen inputs, well, the bean's going to do a better job at fulfilling, helping us with that niche versus the wheat. So it depends, but I think your question is a good one, actually. Yeah, it does highlight that. The weeds can bring lots of benefits. Okay, so here's a one, a study looking at weeds, um, companions of weeds. Can legumes uh, control weeds without decreasing crop yield? Again, we're looking at a big meta-analysis, a review of lots of studies. Uh, so. Uh, we report data from 34 uh, scientific articles corresponding to 476 experimental units. Considering all of these put together, the companion plants had no significant effect on cash crop yield, but significantly decreased the weed biomass by 56% relative to a non-weeded control or 42% relative to a weeded control. Okay, so overall we see less weed biomass pressure, um, yet no negative effects on the main cash crop yield. Thus, the use of legume companions generally seems to enhance weed control without reducing crop yield, but the conditions giving rise to these win-wins should be explored further to encourage the full adoption of the technique. Okay, and again, it's that point that, you know, it's not to say that these things always work perfectly. There are nuances it has to be designed for. Uh, you know, so, so again, there's, there's definitely knowledge gaps that we have in all of this. There's evidence that highlights the potential. The potential is very clear. What we need to do is take that evidence and say, okay, how do we apply this under our local conditions? Let's do some local st studies with your on your soil types, uh, with your varieties available to you. Let's find the good combinations that work under this context. But the, the, the evidence is clear that um, this the potential is, is, is certainly there. This was a really interesting one, looking at weed dynamics, comparing conservation agriculture versus just a pure kind of no, strict no-till approach. So here I'm saying defining conservation agriculture as no-till plus keeping soil covered, stubbles or living plants, plus plant species diversity. That's your three principles of conservation ag. And here we're reviewing the effects of weed management under conservation ag, bringing the three principles in versus 
just a pure kind of no-till approach. So as they highlight here, crop rotation and surface residue, those other parts of conservation agriculture, they can be effective weed control methods. Combining no-till, crop rotation and surface residue offers superior weed control. No-till used with monocultures can result in severe weed infestations. Get no-till on its own is not the answer. It's a piece of a puzzle. It's a piece of a system. And that system needs the diversity and that soil cover. That's what conservation agricultural system is. No-till on its own, use your, we're using exclusively herbicides as your weed management tool. Of course, when you're using one tool, that's going to stimulate and speed up the development of resistance. Yeah, so no-till and monocultures and herbicides will lead to further weed pressure. Conservation agriculture will lead to lower uh, weed pressure. Okay, what about some quick effects on soil organic matter? Soil organic carbon, here we're looking at plant diversity on carbon. So by analyzing 1,001 paired observations, so paired meaning we're comparing plant mixtures to the corresponding monocultures, from 121 publications, we show that both soil organic carbon content and the carbon stocks are on average 5 and 8% higher in the species mixtures than those monocultures. These positive mixture effects increase over time and are more pronounced in deeper soils. Species, species, uh, species rich mixtures effects are consistent across forest, grassland and cropland systems and are independent of background climates. Okay, so again, more plant species diversity can also stimulate more soil organic matter building, building more soil humus. Uh, what about the effects of grazing? Let's just throw animals into the, I'm talking, let's jump off plant species diversity, let's talk diversity for a second. What about the role of bringing animal diversity back into uh, the cropping situation? And here we're looking at grazing inclusion, inclusion and grazing exclusion. So taking a grassland, splitting it in half, on one half they slashed and mowed, on the other half they put the animals in to graze. So that both grasses got, pastures got cut, or, or utilized, but one through cutting, one through the animal. So grazing exclusion, where the animals were excluded, this was associated with less below ground carbon allocation, less root biomass as a result, less root exudation, less microbial biomass, and all of that led to lower soil organic carbon. Because animals, the presence of animals versus just cutting, it does trigger benefits to the below ground interaction, does build soil organic matter. When they mow the grass, did they remove it? Did they make hay? Did they leave on top? Uh, ooh, I'm not too sure. I, th I don't know. Um, but I will say this, that as I touched on earlier, as we now understand, it is roots, not shoots, mm -hmm. that build soil organic matter. So even if the, if the grass was left on top, most of that carbon would have been oxidized off. Very little would have been gained for building soil organic matter. Very little, if any at all. Okay, so that's a little bit on, uh, on some livestock. Um, I'll share this one last study with you, just as a closing one, as an just purely for interest sake. Uh, this is looking now, just stepping out a little bit into the ecology, the wider ecosystem. You know, we, we love this idea that the environment and production and farming, well, these two things must always clash. You know, it's, it's one or the other. And okay, in many examples, of course, that is true. But I want to share an example here with you where indeed farming and environmental benefits or ecosystem gains can indeed be synergistic. They can work together. And again, it's just a matter of finding the right variables, the right win-wins in order to, to make that work. So here's a study again, just from the UK. It's just illustrating a principle here though. Um, principle could be the same anywhere. They took the field and what they did is cut into that field. So we're basically reclaiming the field margins and they cut into the area of production and they planted up the field margins predominantly with four grasses, so some quite tall species grasses, a few little flowers and things and pollinators. <coughs> the bulk of it was simply grasses, tall species grasses. And so they ate into the production area um, by cutting into the field margin, eating into the area under production by 3%, so a lowering of 3% area of production, and then they cut deeper and lowered the area of production by 8%. Okay, so obviously we're reducing the amount of area in production. Of course, yield is going to go down, isn't it? Because we're growing on less land, and we're cutting into that area under production. Of course, our yield's going to go down when we start to give land away to the ecosystem. We plant up the margins with these um, biodiversity strips and, and tall species grasses. 
Well, as you might guess, that wasn't the case. So here we're looking at these three scenarios. So here's our business as usual on the left. The middle column is where we, re we re lowered the land under production by the 3%, and the column on the right is where we lowered the land by 8%, so giving more to the ecosystem. So let's look at yield first. So here we're looking at a couple of yield indices, and as you can see, um, versus the control, the business as usual, when we, ate, when we gave a little bit of land over to the wildlife, 3% uh, of the land, we can see a bit of an increase in the yield there. When we gave even more land over to the wildlife, reduced the area under production, we can see actually an even greater increase in the yield. So this is simply, sure, land went out of production, but what we did is we gained an ecosystem service. That habitat that we created in the field margin created a space for beneficials, which we've measured over here. Here we're looking at the crop pollinators and the predators. So, and as you can see, as we cut into more land or as we gave more land to the wildlife, it was this 8% reduction uh, or 8% gain for the wildlife. You can see where we saw the biggest impacts, much more so than the 3% uh, of pollinators and beneficials. So, of course, what we did was simply create environment for the insects, and then those insects provided an agronomic benefit. Okay, they, prov they were part of an integrated pest management tool. They helped to lower the pest insect, uh, the insect pest pressure, which then we then, therefore, we saw the yield increases. Okay, so I, I share this one purely as interest to highlight that indeed we can support the ecosystem, we can support ecology, and we can still produce food. We can do these two things together. We can improve yield and improve the ecosystem outcome. There can be those win-wins, but uh, indeed we, we have to design for those. Okay, so in summary, more species diversity, any one of these strategies could be employed. More cash crops, wider rotations, annuals, summons, uh, annuals, perennials, winter summons, cover crops as we've discussed today, companions, we get a few examples of intercropping there, and companion cropping, some of those biodiversity strips, field margins, that one we just talked about there, and um, we didn't talk too much about trees, but, but around livestock integration, agroforestry, maybe some silver pastures, Definitely some, some benefits to be had there as well. Okay, one minute over time. Please. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Well, just a question for Joel. Do you have any um, info or whatever on what chemicals and things are softer on your soil? If that makes sense. Uh, there's a bit of work been done on this. Um, there's no simple answer, as you might have guessed. Um, all I'll say is that two things, I guess. One, it is clear that generally that a lot of the older chemistry is a lot harsher. Some of the newer stuff has become more and more selective, uh, so therefore having less broad spectrum negative effects. But really, at the end of the day, um, the answer to your question is that each and every different chemical be that, you know, whatever it might be, insecticide, herbicide, fungicide, each chemical has a specific mode of action. And there will be some groups of organisms who are sensitive to that mode of action and others who are not. And so um, there isn't a clear answer to your question. It's, it's, it just would say that, yes, every chemical would have some impact on some species that will be sensitive to it. There will be others that will be not sensitive. They're the ones that then typically will be playing a role in the detoxification and breaking down of that over time. So they're the ones that are uh, resilient to it, so they will help to break it down. So it's not to say that you know a chemical will kill all of the biology and we have a dead soil or anything like this. It's what it's doing is affecting some species. Now, that's still a concern because what that's doing is creating a, a narrowing of the diversity of the biological activity. And when we, when we narrow the diversity of that biological activity, that's still a concern because what we do know is that in terms of things like disease suppressive soils, we know that disease suppressive soils have wider diversity than disease susceptible uh, soils. So that diversity loss is still important. We're narrowing the diversity, often called dampening the diversity. So you've still got plenty of organisms there. Often, often they will still be functioning at a same or equal biological activity. Um, but you've just lost some of the diversity. And the point is to say that you may have lost some of the key species that perform a very specific key benefit. You might have lost those. So there is cause for concern. I think um, they are tools. 
use them judiciously, use them, try to integrate as many other strategies where possible and keep them up your sleeve for only when absolutely necessary. Um, and the truth is we don't really know the full effects of some of them. We, we haven't even classified or categorized all of those, particularly the microorganisms that live in soil. So how can we say either way when we don't even know who's there yet? We've only identified a handful, a handful of percent of species in the soil, microbiome. So to make kind of strong claims either way, I think is a little loose, but, um, but the, from the evidence we have already, it's clear that some species will always be affected. And that's enough, I think, to be concerned from that lowering of diversity point of view. Yeah. So let's have a quick introduction, uh, just a little bit about where you're from and maybe just a little bit on your main crops and, and or, or um, production systems. And then we'll, we'll explore your questions and mine. But let's do a yeah, quick round of introductions. Yeah, my name's Luke Harrington. Uh, I run a little business called Regen Farming and I basically try and help uh, farmers transition into uh, these sorts of things. And just, uh, I'm probably a bridge between someone like Joel and the farmer because I know you come to these days and it gets a bit overwhelming. There's a huge amount of information and uh, you then go, you go home and go, oh, what do I do about it? And that's where you can contact me and I can help you out with that. That's what, that's what I try and do. Uh, one other thing I'd like to say, thank you Michael for putting this on, uh, it's got a, a good turnout, so support these days. I know where I come from, we, we don't get a lot of support for, for these days, so uh, yeah, support what Michael does, fill those things out and, and uh, yeah, good job Mike. Uh, Brendan Patterson, grain farmer out at Mara, um, growing wheat, barley, oats, canola beans, um, running a zero till full double retention system, uh, no livestock, um, just running a mix with companions across pretty well most of it. It's so, a bit of a summary on me. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Brad Collins. We've got a farm out at Big Springs, about 35 k's southeast of Wagga. Um, we uh, multi-species crop summer and winter um, and we harvest, harvest with our animals so we do a uh, rotational cell grazing system, so la lots of animals in small areas, um, and we try and keep them going all year. Try and have a living root in the soil all year round, that's probably our main goal, and we just try and use the animals to do that. Uh, G'day guys, um, Matt McKinley. Um, I'm here with my father Dave, who's a really, really keen student of, uh, of soil health and better systems. Um, we're north of Coolman, so 30, uh, 25 odd k's north of Coolman. Predominantly uh, grain growers. Uh, in recent times, some reintroduction of, of livestock uh, on a on a small scale, um, with which cover crops played a played a big role in that reintroduction of livestock for us. Um, I guess a key a key feature of our thought process is. Uh, a few years ago, we come to a realisation that a reliance on, like, or, or a system that we had relied on synthetic inputs, fertilisers, wasn't going to be what took us forward. And we sort of pursued avenues and come to a realisation that a system that relies on biology and natural ecosystem function probably was what was going to take us forward. So, you know, cover crops and plant diversity have played a big role in that. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll talk more detail about some of the details. Yeah. So again, I'm very happy to facilitate some questions. Um, if anybody, I'm sure you'll have some. So very happy to hear from you. I don't want to steer all of the conversation. I'd, I'd really be better if it would come from you. But I, I think one that I just would maybe like to kick us off two particular questions was, was really to start off with maybe around species selection. Where did some of you start in terms of, I mean, I put a big, big, big old list of species options up on the screen there. Where did some of you start around narrowing that list of things down? Where do you get your information from? How did you decide what species to put? Again, and then if you could link in a little bit around that, around seeding rates, or again, how you determine that, that would that'd be a nice compliment. But maybe that would be a good kind of first question to kind of get us going. I know that's probably a big one. Um, but yeah, around species selection and then anything on seeding rates, if you can. Might as well start with you, Matt, while you're You've got the mic, you've got the hot, hot seat. Yeah, okay. Turned off, is it? Yep, it's still on. Um, well, firstly, I guess I've got a bit of a love, love, hate, love, hate relationship with, with cover crops. Um, 
So initially we. Um, that's right. Right. It off. That's all right. Um, initially, as a as a way of introducing diversity into our system, we pursued the avenue of uh, trying to incorporate a cover crop between two cash crops over summer, um, as per a sort of a North American or a Northern Hemisphere type system. Um, that turned out not so successful for us, um, so we've, we've moved away for, for various reasons, which if we get time I can, I can go into. It sort of ties into this gentleman's question here about moisture availability in Australia. Um, so species selection uh, in, a, in different forms of cover crops that we use now, uh, mainly during the winter. Uh, I actually prefer to call them fodder crops because we grow them primarily for diversity and stock feed. But I guess growing a, a multi-species or, or a cover crop, it's really, really bloody simple. So there's no reason to make it difficult by trying to choose too many species, by trying to overthink it. So I think if you've got, like, like Joel had up there, a basic, basic selection from a lot of what you might call the food groups or the plant groups, you're feeding the diversity, feeding the biology, uh, different flavours of exudates. So just try and have a good selection from each of the each of the plant groups, I guess. Um, cereals, brassicas, legumes. Um, so it's not about the number; it's just about the about the diversity, I think. Yeah. Also, the the outcome you're trying to achieve. Try and imagine what you want the cover crop to look like at the end. Um, obviously, if you know if it's if it's not, it probably should be a desired outcome to have a lot of ground cover, so a high carbon loading uh, to provide soil armour at the end. So, um, yeah, making sure a good, good amount of cereal species are included in there, sort of all goes through to a good, good amount of ground cover at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Sowing rates and timing? Timing, yeah, it's really just like a, a cash crop. The phenology of the plants that you're sowing need to be matched to the, to the sowing time. Um, I found you, as Joel explained, you your best benefit from your root exudate is coming from when the plant's in that um, before the reproductive stage, the vegetative stage. So yeah, we've sort of noticed that choosing varieties or selecting varieties with longer growing season that will stay in that vegetative stage for longer will give you give you more bang for your buck, more, more time where a plant's in a in a vegetative stage. Yep. But it is important, like everything, to match the sowing time with the phenology of the of the plants you're choosing. If you have too short a season plants growing, you'll get certain species in the mix go to head, become become reproductive, go to seed, and then they're not they're not giving any more. They're taking once they've gone to seed, and that's that's not their desired outcome. Yeah. So, what kind of species have you used? Say that are long, a bit longer growing. Some of those longer vegetative ones. What ones have you played around with? So, with cereal cereal selection, your vernalisation type winter winter cereals, wheats and wheats and oats and that type of thing. We have made some tragic mistakes with that by choosing uh, short season oats in one particular instance. And we saved very early and the, the oats went to head in winter and basically shut the shut the show down for the year. Yeah, yep. So you learn by your mistakes and that, that was one of them choosing a choosing a short season cereal and sowing it too early and um, that vegetative phase in its growth just didn't last long enough to get get the benefit for grazing or for or for root exudates. Yeah. All right. Uh, so when we started doing our multi-species cover cropping, we were coming from a very degraded system. We've been doing production agriculture for years with high inputs, so lots of spray, lots of fur, um, and we ended up with a system that was basically dead. And if we wanted something to grow, we had to put it in the ground. Um, we had to wean our country off its synthetics, so I think the first year we cut our fert back half, then the second year we cut it back half again, and, and now we don't use any fertiliser at all on our system. We don't use any spray at all. We don't have any weeds. We don't call them weeds, everyone else does. Um, but uh, what we're doing is, a minimum species for me would be eight species. I wouldn't go any less than that. Um, the goal is always to maximise how many different varieties of plant I can get in the ground at any given time. Uh, for instance, at the moment um, I'm sowing, uh, and we're sowing winter and summer species together. So I've got millet and corn and sorghum and all that sort of thing mixed in with my, my winter species. 
I might only get a couple of months out of it, that's okay. Um, but they're doing something for the soil while they're there. We're always trying to maximise uh, how much uh, root system we can get in our soils. Um, and the more, more root system we can get, the, the more leaf section we can get as well. Um, we try and keep our plants in that phase two all the time. Um, so we do that by our, our cell grazing. So we'll, if a plant gets to close to a reproductive stage, then we'll come in and we'll smash it back down to sort of the top of phase two, bottom of phase two again, and just let it go again. And we find we can keep that plant going and growing for a lot longer. And the animals, um, we predominantly use sheep. Sometimes if we need cattle, we'll bring adjustment cattle in, which we've got happening this week. Um, so we use different stock types for different purposes. Sometimes we'll get stock in to smash down undesirables. Um, and sometimes uh, we'll give long rest periods to let the beneficial species that we're targeting get away. Um, we're just using a little twin disc machine uh, I think it's only 3.6 metres wide. Some of you guys would be thinking, oh, God, you'd be there all the time. But um, it suits our purposes. Um, we, as I said, we don't use any, any spray unless we really have to. We've used Roundup once in five years, I think, and I felt guilty. Um, so, look, it is all about maximising our cover and maximising that living root in the soil all the time. Uh, we notice that we don't get runoff really at all, even in really heavy downpours, um, that water is hitting the soil and it's going into the soil. Um, we've still got dry dams at home after 150 mils, uh, which is good and bad, but it is good because all that moisture is still there. It hasn't run off, um, which we're loving. Yeah. Brad, come springtime, it's still, those plants are still going to want to push to reproductive. What do you do then? Get more stock. Right. Just make sure nothing ever comes to end. Oh, look, there, there's a time when you need things to go to a reproductive stage, I think. Because I think that, you know, for your soil, for your soil, it's even when it goes reproductive, it's still going to be doing something down that soil. So those, those dead roots of those plants, they're going to open up the pathway for all your other stuff, like your water infiltration and all those other services to take place. Um, so there is a time when you need to let country rest and go reproductive and then you can come in later and smash it down once it's done that um, or sew back into it. Uh, it's going to leave you with some pretty cool cover. So you how do you find the, um, you know, your summer grasses like the millets, like you're sowing them now, so like they just sit there until... Oh, they're germinating. Mm. Well, and what happens in the winter? They'll just die. Yeah. Right. What's on, right? You're putting the millet on. Uh, at the moment, it's only pretty low, probably two kilos. Um, so the reason I'm putting a bit of millet out is I had a bit of seed left over. So I think I had about half a tonne of seed. So I've just put my half tonne of my, my um, summer mix that we, we mix up, which has got about, oh, I think it's about 17 different species of, of things in there. Um, so I'm just blending that in with what we would normally do with our, our winter mix. and. <coughs> Once the four tonne that I mixed up yesterday is all out, we'll go back to our traditional winter mix. Would there be any that wouldn't germinate now and will come up later on? Yeah. Yeah. So you do a summer sowing as well? Yep. Sort of late spring or something? Uh, it's sort of, it's mostly moisture dependent. So if we, if we get a rain and it's, it's warming up enough for those species to, to go, um, I'll get into it as quick as I can. Um, but on the flip side, in autumn, um, I will dry sow. I'll start dry sowing in February, uh, yeah. regardless of what the outlook is, because uh, it's all about the in-crop rainfall. It'll just sit there, and when it's ready, it'll go. So you, you mentioned millet. What, what are some of the other species oh, that, you're, wow. that are your favorites? Or that, yeah. are, that are like central to all of your mixes? So. OK, so my summer mix is. Uh, we ready for the crazy talk? So we go down to Southwest Stock Feeds and we buy pigeon mix. And that pigeon mix is cheap as, and it's got about six different species that we want in there, including safflower, it's got uh, 
cowpeas, it's got uh, sorghum, it's got pearl millet, it's got um, corn and some radish in it. So we use that as a bit of a base, but then I'll also add five kilos of um, shiroi millet uh, per hectare. We'll add a couple of different types of sunflowers, sun hemp, turnip, plantain, chicory, radish, lucerne. I'll also have some wheat, oat, wheat and oats in there um, and it, it'll just sit there till we get a good rain when it cools off a bit. Um, but really that, that summer mix has got about 17 species in it. Um, we treat it all with uh, a verma juice like worm juice before it goes, as it goes up the auger and that's pretty much all it gets. Uh, we aim for a really good selection of herbs, forbs and grasses so we want to have all three of them in our mix. Some of what we plant is not palatable to the animals. They won't like it, they'll leave it. But that's okay because it's actually doing a really good environmental service for us, whether it's got a beautiful tap root like, um, like a, a safflower um, or you know sometimes it's, it's, it might be a great pollinator but the stock won't eat it. That's okay. It's not there for the stock. We just use the stock to transfer those nutrients back into the ground. We try and make a bit of money along the way. So you're, you're basically totally annual based? No, no, no. So there's, we've got, um, we've got some uh, perenniality in our system. So because we're not spraying, um, we've got phalaris in our pastures, we've got a lot of the natives have come back in, uh, we've got some fescues, we've got... So they're already there. I'm just trying to add to it. So if we're adding 10 to 20 species, there might already be eight to 10 species out in the paddock. Um, I suppose our end goal would be, we would love to have about 80 species. If I can get 80 species by the time I die, I'll be pleased. So, so you're just overselling those? You're just yep. drilling into the Just existing... drilling straight into what's there. Yeah. Okay. Um, sometimes germination is an issue if there's already something established uh, and it doesn't happen the way you want it to but I find if we can come in then and hit it hard with, with some stock that'll activate what's sitting there and it'll kick along. It may not be as quick as you want it to be but it happens. That's because of trampling. Yep, yeah the herd effect. So, what's, uh, so what's the recognised annual rainfall at Big, at big Springs? Uh, so uh, 650 mils, mm. I think we got 320 last year, mm. yeah but 650 is our, our average, I'd, we've never hit it, we've either been over or under it. <laughs> 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 Can I ask a sort of question about the nutrient density of the soil? Yep. Uh, you um, what you're driving then, I understand everything you're doing from an environmental sense, but you've got to make money. Are you making money out of your livestock enterprise? Can you explain? I mean, I'm sure you are, but that's not what you can. you explain that a little bit, please? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we are making money, which is terrific. Um, I think when we were doing production ag, we weren't making money. We do a budget every year, and I never once hit it. Um, every time there'd be more urea, more spray, some sort of outbreak you had to deal with get to the end of the year and you're thinking well we just scraped through. Um, so what we're doing now is we're deliberately trying to work with nature not against nature. Um, so that's why we're actually not an organic system uh, in the true sense of, of, of a certified organic but we are an organic system in that we don't use any synthetics. We'll use targeted chemical if we, we feel we have to. Um, the end game for us I think long term is that we want to leave something for our kids that's worthwhile, that's a lot better than what we got and we, we just, I suppose we're taking a very long view that um, we want to leave something behind for the future that is going to be terrific. Um, I don't need to make much money to get by on, I've got pretty simple means, I don't have a high maintenance wife, um, so <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty easy to, to get by on what we make. We don't need to be rich. Like we, this is not, not a driver for me. So if we can make enough to get by on, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, but for me, it ke constantly keeps coming back to the soil. Um, if I've got functioning, happy uh, soil, 
and I can tell when it's doing it because it smells different, it feels different. Um, you walk on it and it's nice and soft. It infiltrates moisture. Um, the plants all look pretty happy growing there. Um, we've got, we've actually got so many ladybugs at home at the moment. It's absolutely crazy. They're everywhere. I've got no idea what they're eating, but they're eating something. Um, so those beneficial species, to see them working. And you can see when you sow a crop, when you've got a tree line, um, the insects that are coming in off that tree line, uh, for 20 or 30 metres, you can just see the impact they're having on those, those paddocks. Um, so, yeah, the end game for me is to have a low maintenance system. Um, we are increasing perenniality all the time, so in eight to 10 years, I actually hope I'm not doing this anymore. I'm hoping that I've got so many species in there that, you know, I'll just manage it with the herd. I won't need to do any more of this multi-species cover cropping. For me, this is a recovery process to get our soil functionality back to where it should be. So it becomes economically viable because you've got such low input costs relative to the synthetics. But do you sort of measure it as in how many kilograms of lamb or beef or whatever you turn off for? Yeah, we measure everything. And yeah, yeah. Just, I guess that's what the, the economists would say, you know, your profit or whatever per hectare or whatever. You yeah, know, look, there's, that. that's, yeah, that's yeah we, we, we measure our economic profit, but we also try to measure our, our environmental profit, yeah. like our, um, and that's in our, our soil health, our plant diversity, our animal health, like, if we've got healthy soils, we've got healthy plants, we've got healthy animals, healthy people. Um, so, from a holistic context, we, that's, that's the, I won't say we get it every time, but that's what we're aiming for. That's the intent. Can I, can I say something on that economic side of it? Just some numbers that a farmer that I work with, he, he started about five years ago. So his uh, fertiliser bill is down 260 odd thousand. His vet bill does not exist anymore. He's a dairy farmer. Um, he's uh, the happiest dairy farmer I know anyway. Um, so, and he has no herbicide bill anymore, but his milk production is pretty much the same. So that's a huge driver. Oh, and his, his minerals that he was giving his cattle in the bale every day when they were milking is down 100,000. So that's not, bad. that's not a bad holiday money. Can I just um, like a comment on, you said, you just, there's a passing comment, the happiest dairy farm you know. Yep. What is the cost? of that as farmers, of our happiness in terms of our overall health. And I think that's something that we often look at purely the numbers of what is our overall happiness. And I think that's something that we often miss in these conversations, but it's really important. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That, that, can go, that can go two ways. That could be a real two-edged sword. Um, when you're acknowledging that change is needed and you're feel somewhat unsupported by the general community and you're really striving to implement change on your farm, it doesn't always bloody work the first time. Mm, yeah. So happiness doesn't come instantly with change. <laughs> there's a real bloody lag phase there. A transition, <laughs> and yeah. I can promise you, there's a real lag phase there with, yeah. with, with happiness in change. So, you know, that it really tests your your conviction, I guess, and your and your and your and your, your inner strength yep. mm. and your resilience, um, because you know when you're making a change that it's not going to work the first time, probably. Um, so you've got to have that resilience to get to get through that yep. that transition. Yep. Yeah. And the community to yeah. help you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big thing. Yeah. yeah. To, to acknowledge that it's delayed gratification of what we're actually seeking. Yeah. Because it's the long term it, game. Like it, it can be very romantic to think that the, the ladybirds and everything make you happy instantly. It, it doesn't. For some it might, but not for all. Yeah. <laughs> so Brendan, how does it work without the animals? Yeah. So yeah, talk, talk, we're still on the species selection, seeding rate. I mean, no, happy to, for it to diverge. That was very good. So let's, let's keep that going. But it, we come back to that point around species selection and how does it work without animals? Let's link those together. Yeah. Um, it's definitely geared well for animals, but I don't know, I just feel I'm just trying to make it work without them. Um, like as for selections, well, we just went in with, um, moved away from our monoculture a few years ago with our cereals, then went into just adding one, just added some radish, 
It's purely just as an accumulator to bring up some nutrients from depth, help feed the crop. Um, just tried to cut down on our synthetic inputs. Just purely take some costs out if we could. And then added, added a legume, just give a bit of nitrogen as well. Um, just assisting there, yeah, promoting more biological aspects of it all. Um, just yeah, feed it all, cycle, get all the stubble to cycle that way instead of putting it through an animal. Um, at the moment we're finding it's working well in the low rainfall years, the last couple of years. Um, yeah, we still pulled a fair bit of grain off um, with not a lot of input gone into it while growing several different things at once. You know. um, we are terminating the companions early spring, so and then just taking the monoculture through to harvest. So um, it was finding that early termination in the springs, assisting with the cycling, feeding, the feeding that cash crop that year. So not relying on a lot of nitrogen, um, a lot of other fertilizers at the start. Um, so how far it's working. So you mentioned uh, radish and legumes as yep. your early companions. How are you determining kind of what seeding rates of those to use? Um, not putting a real lot out, like radishes are sort of that half a kilo to a kilo. Um, the legumes, yeah, playing around that eight to 12 kilos, somewhere in there. Um, it's just tweaking from year to year. Um, What's the legumes? I've yeah. uh, got vetches, uh, lentils, uh, mixed in with cereals, in with canola. Um, you'll get a random favour bean, obviously still come up from residual seed. But um, yeah, haven't really found a negative impact from having too many of something yet. Um, don't know that might be only around the corner, but we don't know yet. We'll just keep adding a few more or taking a few more out. Putting more together, just trying to be more diverse. Yeah, so putting um, two legumes together, well I won't have a big rate, I'll just have a low rate of both. Are you inoculating everything or? Staying with the same group at the moment, so the inoculation's there from year to year, so if I don't inoculate them real well, well, the pressure's not there. And, and have you done any of the diverse covers? Are you still at just the more companion cropping stage? Have you gone to kind of the cocktail mixtures of anything? Yeah, probably back in 16, we put a couple of weedy paddocks out with a cocktail mix and then just adjusted some stock in from next door but that was back then, never, haven't gone back to that yet. Um, just felt just trying to do it through the cropping system mainly, mm -hmm. trying to do it without the livestock as I don't have enough infrastructure there to run the livestock properly. Yeah. Um, yeah. May see enough merit with enough people doing it that might have to do it one day, but mm, yeah. hoping not to. Small steps. Small steps. Well, yeah. and where you did that cover and grazing, any, any observation on the cash crops that followed that? Was there any difference? Um, no, the, no, not really. The subsequent crops were quite healthy, but um, I don't know, I just noticed the bloke that brought his stock over, he did comment that his livestock did a lot better on that crop as opposed to the straight oats he had back on his farm over the road. Mm -hmm. So um, his lambs weren't scouring, he did put a bit more weight on, and he didn't have any deaths. So to me, it, the cocktail mix seemed to work well for the livestock. I've got a question around um, soil constraints. So, uh, for example, if you've got a high pH or a low pH, or if you've got compaction, how does how does it, and if it does, how does that impact what mix you would put into the into into your? It might be a question for Joel. I don't know, or, or someone else on the team. Anybody? So, soil pH. Just just reiterate. Sorry. Oh, so. Your soil constraints, so for example, if you've got a low pH, does that affect what you put into your mix um, in yeah. terms of uh, or compaction or like this? Yeah, well, you know, the chemical physical side yeah, of it. I the comment I'd make there is um, to have a healthy impact on, on your soil and your ecosystem, you need the plant to be healthy. So you, you need it to be to be exuding at its maximum potential, photosynthesizing at its maximum potential. So putting, selecting a plant that's not going to perform in an environment where there's constraints is not going to provide a good outcome. Yep, so, and you know, the same could be said for fertilising cover crops. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's jumping ahead too far, but 
you, you need those plants to be healthy to provide that, that service to the soil, to provide that, that exudate. Um, if you have confidence that the plants will be healthy without fertiliser, well, yeah, maybe not. Um, and by fertiliser, I don't mean, you know, synthetic inputs either, you know, just some, some mineral support or whatever else you would do to try and support any plant. But the overriding thing, I think, is that the plants need to be healthy to provide the service and you've got to provide that environment for them to be healthy. Luke, I think you had something to add? Yeah, well, with uh, your soil constraints, that's why you put in a cover crop, to fix those soil constraints. So a compaction, for, for example, you would pick a plant that's going to help you with compaction. If you pH, I don't uh, sort of take as much notice in because I find the plants, as we were looking on the slide before, they'll actually make their own pH. They'll make themselves, that's, that's, their, that's what they do in nature. Um, yeah, so you design your whatever you're going to put in for the constraint for your end goal. Yeah. So if your end goal is to break up compaction, well, you'll put in more radish or more taprooted type stuff. If your end goal is is N, you'll put in more things that'll fix N. So that's that's what it, that's what you're using them for. Yeah. So. I mean, while you've got the mic, a little bit on any species selection and things that you've you've played around with. Oh, look, we've we've mainly done uh, for. Uh, dairy guys at the moment so they've just been quite diverse like with 10-15 like, different things in them plus whatever is in the paddock um, so and once again it's it's splitting it up you've got to have your grasses your broad leaves your and there's a cheddar pod too that um, people talk about that they say really starts to get the uh, get the system going as well so that's things like sugar beet and spinach and quinoa and things like that and they, and they say you put all all five together and it really kicks in but in Australia we struggle get, to get that tuna pot in so we're working on that at the moment but um, yeah it's yeah mainly for compaction around us it's a lot of radish and and those deep, deep tap rooted things and yeah and nitrogen seems to be the, the things but we just keep as diverse as we can a lot of, and cereals as well and you said that's mostly in a dairy situation you're working yeah, on? Yeah, dairy, sheep, livestock mainly, and, we're sta and we've now got some uh, sort of mixed farmers that are getting much more involved, so, which, is, which is good. And so how are they integrating some of those covers with pastures? Is that a rotational thing or is it also overseeding? Like, um, yeah, pasture? we're just drilling straight into whatever's there because we're starting at a really low base. Like our soils are pretty trashed. Our, our average organic carbon would be uh, 1.5 to or well, actually 0.5 to 1.5 is an average soil test. Uh, so we're starting from a pretty low base, so we're just trying to put as much as much species in there to get as many of those exudates going, so to build as much soil carbon as we can get. So that's that's our starting goal. So, yeah, so we yeah we have no trouble, we just oversow it and then terminate it if we have to, uh, livestock if we have to, whatever whatever's there for the farmer. Like whatever you've got, make use of it. So, so you're using cattle for termination? Cattle, yeah, cattle, sheep, sprays, what, right. whatever, that, whatever works yeah. for the farmer. Don't yeah. let, um, don't let what you don't have be a constraint to your soil health program. Just get in and get it done. One of the things that we do is, um, if we're looking to sow, we'll smash it pretty hard with the stock before we sow it. Um, so while we're not spraying, we're, we're taking as much of the the, uh, I suppose, competition out as we can so that we can get the other species established as quick as we can as well. Um, so you, yeah, if you can, we still, we don't really refer to it as competition, they're companion plants, but if we can reduce the established plants to get the new new plants in going, that's what we'll do, we use stock to do it. Right, and that's why you dry sow, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and just, I'm a bit lazy, so yeah, you know, just do it when I can do it, and when it starts to rain, I can sit inside and enjoy it. Okay, any any other questions? Just um, what do people think this all organic matter should be? Eight percent, six to eight percent. Yep. Yep. Anything under two, it's not functional, is my understanding. So. Your, your soil's just not functioning. If you've got under 2%, your soil's just not functioning. So uh, it should be at least over that. Do you know historically what our carbon levels were? 
Yeah, Christine Jones done a fair bit of work on that. Um, anywhere from sort of three or four percent through to over twenty. Um, so I work in private bank here at Wynwood Health, and we've got a number of our members do um, private bank work. Um, and one of the Sure, yep. So if we're talking soil organic carbon, that's always going to be a lower number, and that's the one that you would often say would be you'd like to see that at least above your 2%. That's, that's measuring the carbon, as it says. When we talk about soil organic matter, that's going to include carbon, but also some hydrogen, some oxygen, some other nutrients there. It's more of a, a diverse mixture. So your minimum kind of organic matter would generally be around that 4%, say, as a minimum. That number is always going to be a bit higher because it includes some of the extra components. So if you're talking about strict soil organic carbon, we'd say, yeah, you'd want, like to see a minimum of 2%. If it was soil organic matter, you'd probably say minimum of kind of 4%, but, but, but higher on both of those ideally, but that's, that's a little nuance. Yeah, don't get those two confused. They are different things, yeah. And it's important to have that carbon there because that's where your soil life lives, that's where your minerals are held, that's where your moisture's held. So the more of that you've got, the more of all the other things that you've got. So that's, it's a really important thing to measure and keep an eye on. Right. Just on that whole issue of, of uh, organic matter and soil carbon, for people <coughs> in our environment in this part of the world, are there examples of where they've through adopting some of these practices, they've made dramatic increases in, in those, those levels and over what time frame. You guys, I mean, I've got a few thoughts in my head, but you probably would have better local examples than I. I mean, the one that jumps to my mind is Colin Sice. I mean, you know, him doing pasture cropping, no disturbance and repeating that and having those perennials there, deeper rooters. <coughs> Uh, he saw some big increases at depth. I think he's the one that jumps out to me, but I don't know if you guys have got some others. But. Well, we were, I think we were running at about 0.5, and now we're probably up, up over two now. That's taken us about four years to get to that level. Um, so it's a, it's, I don't know, the, the first, uh, first summer crop we put in, I reckon maybe one plant in 100 terminated, like one, one seed in 100, it was atrocious. Um, now we get a much better result, but it just takes time to, you know, to improve the soil health, to get it back to functionality. Um, we've, we've got a long way to go, we really do, but we're on the right track. Have you seen it visually change? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things, we, when people come and visit the farm, we, we actually ask them, how does it feel? You know, how does the farm feel? And nearly everyone will say, yeah, it feels good because um, the soil is soft. Even in summer, even when it's been dry, there's a softness to the soil. You walk out there, it's not hard. It's, it, you, you can feel the sponginess in it. Um, so there's a, there's a visual change. The soil is always covered, so we, we never have uncovered soil. I suppose if we had a paddock that had only 90% soil cover, we'd be, we'd be thinking, oh, this is no good. Um, the other thing is the, the, the smell of the soil changes, like you've got to carry a shovel with you everywhere, but the smell of the soil changes, you know, you can smell the soil when it, you know, it just smells, I don't know how to describe it, but you give me a, a compacted soil and a, a, a well functioning soil and they, they have a very different smell about them. Um, so the, the soil does take on a very different smell. Yeah. I think the other thing we noticed too was particularly when it rains, we don't get the runoff into the dams anymore. At all. So yeah. that's a real you know, slap over the head to say something's going on. And then, you know, it, it's good because you know that the rain's going where it needs to be in the soil, which is your biggest sponge and your biggest water storage on your place, but not into the dam where you might need it for the livestock to be able to drink from it. Would you be able to put a shovel in it in the early summer? Yeah, yeah. Um, but we use rotational cell grazing, so we're putting fences up and taking them down all the time. Uh, we use hot wires. Um, there's the odd place where you can't tread it in, but um, 
Michael was out there putting uh, electric fence stays in there a little while ago. What, how was it? Yeah, it's good. No, so really good. Even in the middle of summer before we had rain, those treadings are just tread straight in. Um, there's a few paddocks that probably were the last paddocks we farmed. Um, they're still pretty hard. So, you know, you're looking around for a grass to put your tread in, in like a perennial grass, and they'll go straight in. But, um, yeah, so, look, yeah, it is different. There is a difference in the soil, and you can see it, and you can smell it, you can feel it. So what you'll find pretty quickly when you go down this path, and you don't even have to use cover crops to do it, you can use biostimulants or whatever, you head down the soil health path, the aggregation changes within a couple of years. It's not, it's not something that happens really fast, but it doesn't take that long. And once you get that to happen and your infiltration, your air goes in it, that speeds the process up. So um, it's something that you'll see pretty quick. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd agree. I think the early indicators of change happen quickly. The, the longer term things, sure, of course, building soil organic matter takes time, but some of the early indicators uh, do happen quickly. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. To say that the effect of having carbon flowing in your system is recognisable before the soil test picks it up. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah before, the, before the numbers change, yeah. the, the visual changes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Just coming back to your species before, I don't know if you've, I think you sort of stopped halfway through. No, I sort of did. Yeah, just wanted to yeah. expand on the, you know, your photo crop approach. Yeah, so <clears throat> your question you asked while Joel was speaking to me is the elephant in the room all the time when you're talking about cover crops. Moisture. Um, Moisture. Yeah, so different environments, different strategies. Um, it's just so, it's so relevant. You're, you're the only person that's really qualified to make a judgment what works on your farm, what, what's giving you a service on your farm. So just, yeah, this is going to be a long answer, sorry. Yeah. But, but just in relation to that question, you know, the, the notion of the, the Christine Jones carbon cycle, the green plants all year round, it's, it's really sound science. Like it's, there's nothing flawed about that. But trying to overlay it in a, in a cropping system uh, where your productivity is reliant on, or has become reliant on stored soil moisture, has, has, it, it proved really challenging for us, okay? So we went into it with an attitude that we're not sure if this is gonna work, but we're gonna give it every opportunity to work, growing summer cover crops, so outside of our cash, our cash crop time. And you know, in hindsight, it's not surprising that the moisture bet, the moisture deficit from those summer cash cover crops really had a devastating effect on, on our cash crops, our winter cash crops. So the net result was, over, over a number of years, is that over a 12 month period, we feel we actually had less photosynthesis and less root exudate because our cash crop was severely compromised, okay? And of course the flow on effect is less less yield, less profit. And you know, a, a system that's less profitable that damages your, your business health doesn't doesn't interest me personally. So it led in, in our case and, and I know others in our situation, it's led to a situation where we had to look to incorporate diversity within the cash crop growing season. So what, where it sort of led to, to cut a long story short, we look upon our cash crops now in a way as cover crops, okay? So cover crops with a harvest. So we overlay the, the principles of cover crops onto our cash crops because we found it detrimental to our system to try and incorporate a cover crop and a cash crop in one year, in one season. So. Getting you know, your question about the, the site specific and the region specific variables, that's just an example of, I guess, I guess an attempt to, to introduce a system that we sort of saw working in, in North America really well and I believe, I believe Europe really well, been to Europe lately and I can see why it works so well there. During their, during their non-cash crop period, their biggest problem is trying to manage excess water on their, on their fields. So very, very different set of scenario, different, uh, different resource concern to farming north of Coolman. So, um, yeah, I just think that that question was such an important question. I just wanted to share that, that anecdote there about being 
making your own decisions on your own farm is, is so important. But about the species selection, so so overlaying I'm the, them down by the way, I'm not doing Facebook. Oh right. <laughs> so in our in our cash crops, like I said, we just try and have a plant from one of the three food groups, a cereal, a brassica and a legume. Um, a really sweet little mix that seems to be working really good is um, one kilo of tillage radish and 10 kilos of veg. Um, so we'll try different variations of that. Um, we've actually seen, I wouldn't say consistent, but we have measured yield increases when comparing it to um, nil, like nil diversity strips. Um, I don't think that's trying to, in that we're not addressing the maximum yield, we're not trying to maximise yield but it's having a massive effect on reducing yield minimising factors like like abiotic stress, frost, disease and so forth. Yeah, yeah. yep. So we're actually finding our, big, our biggest benefit to productivity and profitability is taking a focus off trying to maximise yield, which what monocrops are designed for, to trying to minimise yield Not deficiencies. Mm -hmm. Because it's very rare that our maximum yield potential is met because of because of other factors, abiotic stresses. Um, so that's in our in our cash crops, our grain crops, our cereal crops. That's one good little mix. But with the the grazing crops, like the cover crops, yeah, we, we just don't really have have rules. It's sort of we just try different stuff all the time. But but we do have that intent to try and at the end try and have a good amount of carbon, a good a good amount of lignin uh, above ground to just to provide that armour after the cover crop service is done. And you just leave that armour for the summer. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thanks a lot. So you'll still spray fallow over the summer and when you do you, you try and use like the softer chemicals or it's just yeah, so summer fallow, it's probably the thing I hate most about our whole our whole system. That's what I hate most about the whole no-till cropping system. Um, for us in our environment, you know, the, the moisture limitation is, is real. Um, we, we summer fallow, we use glyphosate. We we think hard before we do, we don't use it really nearly. And like there is some things we've developed, you know, some new techniques in recent times, just trying to chelate that that molecule and, and buffer that molecule with some organic compounds, um, fulvic acid and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, which which I think's, you know, it doesn't make it it doesn't make it a good thing, but it makes it not such a bad thing. Yeah. It do, it does help break the molecule down in the soil. Yeah. And, like? and fulvic acid. fulvic acid just as a organic compound, yeah. Yep. And you should also try and get your pH down too with a citric acid in it yep. as well. So your glyphosate works best at know, three, three and a half yep. Um, yep. pH. So you want to try and get around that mark. Yep. Since we started the fulvic acid thing, we have noticed with some testing we've done soil residues and to a greater extent uh, crop residues. Um, yeah, the, the, the AMPA, like the Roundup molecules really really getting broken down fast. Do you know how long they'll last? How long do you reckon they'll last? Yeah, the, 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 roundup. the Roundup molecule? Yeah. I think in in a traditional system, a synthetic fed system, I think they'll last a long, long time. But we've actually proven and demonstrated that in a, in a healthier system, it, it can be broken down very rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. Minimising the impact environmentally. Yeah. Yeah. The much more the concern is the breakdown product, it's the AMPA. The glyphosate itself wrap, break down, breaks down fairly quickly within a couple of weeks or so. It's the AMPA that's the byproduct that then has the much longer um, resistance, um, lingering residual, thank you, uh, time. And it's the one that's also more concerning from its toxicity point of view. It's the one that's been shown to be phytotoxic to the plant and, and then will linger around for a number of years. Uh, glyphosate itself less so, uh, amper more concerning. Yeah. It's a biological process breaking down the molecule, the glyphosate molecule, so if you're acting to promote biological processes, you're, you're acting to promote the breakdown of, of the molecule. Yeah. What's your rate of uh, fulvic acid per hundred to try and get your pH to that three, three and a half? Um, so citric acid is used for the for acidifying, yeah. uh, and that look that 
that just depends on so many things. You're starting, you're starting pH and your your additives and mixture and so forth. You've really got to test and trial that. Yeah. But um, for fulvic acid, just a 75% solution we're using at 10, uh, 100 mils per hectare. And that's spread on uh, 100 mils per hectare. Fulvic in the tank mix, 100 mils per hectare. So however that however that calculation works with your yeah. with your with your application rate. Uh, of 75% solution. So fulvic acid is just the carbon source, it's the citric that you want for the acidifying and you, if you want to work that acidifying just take a say a litre of water and of your spray water and scale it back to a litre and just add small amounts of citric acid and measure that to get down to that pH of 3 and then go back and scale that back up to per 100 litres or per 1000 litres kind of thing so just scale it back and then do your weights and then scale it back up um, to work that out. It won't be much. I don't think anyone, anyone, anyone thinks that doing that makes using glyphosate a good thing, but it certainly makes it less of a bad thing. Yeah. You can, yeah, you can drop your rates of glyphosate considerably, and um, so that's a, that's a good thing. And it's a good thing for your back pocket too. Can, uh, farmers around the world consistently, it's this 30 odd percent reduction in, in your herbicide rate. It seems to be a very safe and consistent number that I hear. 25 to 30 percent um, lowered herbicide rate when the pH is dropped to three and then add a carbon source. I, I know even farmer in the UK uses molasses, even a molasses carbon source can do the job. Fulvic works particularly good, it's very good at the job, but even molasses can work. Um, it's just the carbon source and then get that pH down to three. That's your key. Yeah. yeah just previously in your presentation, you said that the yield increased on the half sowing rate. Do you know what those rates were? Uh, for, for the cocktail mix, no, I don't. Um, I, I don't think I've got a note on that on my slide. Um, I don't know. I mean, it was in the U.S. It was. Um, it was on. If you're familiar with Jay Fura and Minokin Farm, it was on. It was on his far, on their trial farm um, in which they were playing around with that. Um, that's where that came from. Let me just see. I've got some notes on here. No, I don't. I, I don't know what the seeding rate was. No, sorry. Yeah. Um, firstly, thanks so much for Joel and these guys. I think it's really important to get this local context. Um, you know, I know from my own personal experience, you know, it's probably a journey rather than a destination, so to speak. And I think one of the things I really want to try and help support people is if you do want to. Um, you know, talk to each other as much as you can, share information because that's the type of conditions where I think a practice change will happen. Um, so we will certainly want to, you know, look at getting involved with, you know, Vic No-Chill or FarmLink or whoever it is, some of the local organisations um, and create a support network around you, especially when you're making big changes in your business. Sometimes it can, um, you know, exactly, you know, Matt, in terms of you really doubt what you're doing and, and you're thinking everyone's telling me to do something else um, but yeah I think it, it, you need to have clear goals and at the end of the day you can really only make a decision that you know you're the one who's making that and you've got to make it in the best interest of your business and of your family. Um, can I just say one other thing yep. with that? When you're going down this path and uh, this is a, a, a saying that uh, was told to me a long time ago or something else but you've got to take the time it takes because it'll take less time so don't get in and just go hard and then have a failure and go, it's not going to work. You've got to, you've got to chip away at it because it does take a bit of time and it will take less time if you just systematically work your way through it. Mm. Yeah, exactly right. So anyway, thank you guys and cool. also thanks a lot to Joel. Thank you. We, I think, I don't know, you probably underestimate, we're really lucky to get him for a day like this or half a day. And um, so, yeah, I appreciate it. It wouldn't have happened if we knew or didn't know if people were going to turn up. So yeah. um, <laughs> it's good. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. At the end of the day, we ended up with 43 landholders in the room and 15 uh, TAFE students. Uh, I think the highlight of the day was the panel discussion, uh, getting those local examples of what farmers have been doing on their own properties in the Riverina. Uh, it's always great to bring those principles uh, from around the world back to our area and see them being adapted into our local production system. If there's any further information that you require from this, please feel free to contact me
Appreciate your time listening to this workshop. Thank you.